Welcome to the, our Constitution Day program for 2009. I'm Sally Ryder. I'm the director of the Rehnquist Center here at the law school. This is the 11th year the Constitution Day program has been held here, and the third year it's been sponsored by the Rehnquist Center. I want to especially thank the Marshall Foundation, whose support has made today's program possible. As usual, we have a great lineup on our panel, but before I introduce them, I just want to talk about the format. We're going to talk about four cases. We're going to spend about 40 minutes on each case. Professor Marcus will give a little introduction to each case. It'll last about 10 minutes, um, maybe longer for his initial introduction. And then we'll, uh, we'll have about half an hour where the panelists will comment on what Professor Marcus has said. And then if we have time, we'll take audience questions. And uh, we'll take a break from 2.25 to 2.35. We'll end around 4 o'clock, and then there will be a reception afterwards. So um, I'll start on the far right with Justice Scott Bales, who has served on the Arizona Supreme Court since 2005. Prior to joining the court, he was in private practice at Lewis and Rocha, and he also served as the Solicitor General of the State of Arizona. He was an assistant U.S. attorney in the District of Arizona from 1995 to 1999. And during that time, he um, worked in the Justice Department in Washington. In addition to serving on many bar and other professional committees, Justice Bales has taught at Harvard, at the ASU Law School, and here at the University of Arizona James E. Rogers College of Law. Justice Bales is a graduate magna cum laude of Harvard Law School, received an MA in economics from Harvard University, and his BA summa cum laude from Michigan State University. Following his graduation from law school, he spent a year in the office of the Solicitor General in the U.S. Department of Justice, then served as a law clerk to Judge Joseph T. Sneed, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and then to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Next to Justice Bales is Greg Garr. Greg has just recently joined Latham & Watkins in D.C., where he will chair the firm's Global Supreme Court and Appellate Practice Group. Prior to joining Latham, Mr. Garr served as the 44th Solicitor General of the United States. As Solicitor General, Mr. Garr was the federal government's top lawyer before the Supreme Court and was also responsible for overseeing the federal government's litigation in the federal appellate courts. Prior to his confirmation as Solicitor General, he served as Principal Deputy Solicitor General for three years, then as Acting Solicitor General. And also from 2000 to 2004, he served as an assistant to the Solicitor General. So he's the only person who's ever held all of those positions in the office of the Solicitor General. Quite a distinction. He's argued 27 cases before the Supreme Court, including two of those that we'll discuss today, Iqbal, Ashcroft against Iqbal and FCC against Fox Television. Mr. Garr received his JD degree with high honors from the George Washington University Law School and his BA degree cum laude from Dartmouth College. Following his graduation from law school, he served as a law clerk to Judge Anthony J. Sirica of the United States Court of Field appeals for the Third Circuit, and also for Chief Justice Rehnquist. And to my immediate right is our own David Marcus, who's an associate professor of law here. Prior to joining the law school in 2006, Professor Marcus served as a law clerk to Judge William Fletcher on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, served as a lecturer and legal writing instruct instructor at Stanford Law School, and was in private practice in San Francisco. He also served as a law clerk to Aline Ross on the District Court for the Eastern District of New York. Professor Marcus received his JD from Yale Law School and graduated magna cum laude from Harvard University. So please welcome our panelists, and I'll turn it over to Professor Marcus. It's certainly an honor to be included on this panel and have the very welcome task of presenting some highlights from the last uh, term of the Supreme Court to you all. It's also quite humbling to share the stage with Justice Bales and General Garr. Uh, the best way to sum up how I feel at the moment is to quote the immortal words of Admiral James Stockdale, Ross Perot's choice for Vice President in 1992, when at the debate he had with Al Gore and Dan Quayle, he said, who am I, why am I here? Um, I'll let Justice Bales and General Garr uh, figure out which is Dan Quayle and who's Al Gore. <coughs> my, my, field is, my field is civil procedure, not constitutional law. But as my father once said of me, Dave, you have a remarkable ability to hide deep ignorance with a torrent of words. So let me unleash the torrent. Perhaps the most significant event of this past term was not an opinion at all, but Justice Souter's decision to step down. As you all know, President Obama appointed now Justice Sonia Sotomayor to replace him. 
Once it became clear that Justice Sotomayor hadn't smoked pot with law students who were run for state office on a pro-segregation platform, her confirmation was all but a done deal. Her judicial record, amounting to thousands of decisions as a district and circuit judge, reflected nothing so much as a moderate and careful juristic personality. But it would not be a Supreme Court nomination without a confirmation fight and the requisite senatorial outrage. And for Justice Sotomayor, the outrage stemmed from two, in, in, chief, in, in chief measure, from two extrajudicial statements she uttered. In one, she had the temerity to suggest that a wise Latina judge might approach an employment discrimination case better than a white male judge. In the other, she had the absolute gall to claim that the Court of Appeals is where policy is made. President Obama handed his political opponents some fuel to add to this fire when he said that he wanted a judge who understood the role of empathy uh, in judging, and when he said that while the law can resolve 95% of cases, in 5% of the time that leaves the judge's heart as the, uh, uh, as the dispositive instrument. Why did these comments spur such controversy? Take Justice Sotomayor's policy comment. It's irrefutable that the Court of Appeals judge is where policy is made. American tort law is living testament to, this, to the truth of this. There are a number of reasons why this idea that the person who the judge is matters and that the judges do in fact create law and not just interpret, why these ideas are so threatening. Perhaps one of them is we're still suffering the, the after effects of the hangover from the Warren Court. Maybe we also uh, are, are in an era that's been dominated intellectually by Justice Scalia with his belief in the rule of law as the law of rules. Mostly I think that this country suffers from an overwrought and unjustified fear of judging. The idea that a decision with legal consequence for hundreds of millions of people could turn on who the judge is and not on the apersonal and apolitical application of rules scares us to no end. If this is true, then do we not live in a, a government of judicial absolutism? Maybe so, but we used to celebrate judges like Holmes and Cardozo, who acknowledged frankly the human element in judging, who knew that judges must create law, that, deriving their, their law from precedent and text for sure, but also relying on the better angels of their nature. We, uh, we, we knew this, uh, but since the legal realists explained this so well to us in the 1930s, laid bare the fact that the law con contains all the imperfections and ambiguities of human life more generally. We've changed course. We cover up the dirty little secret that sometimes rules run out and judges have to judge with a host of devices, original public meaning, uh, plain text and judicial minimalism among others. We celebrate Ch Chief Justice Roberts' claim that the judge is nothing more than a mechanistic umpire calling balls and strikes like a machine, while we denounce Justice Sotomayor's patently true claim that a judge is a policymaker. Each of the four decisions we'll discuss today reflects in my mind this fear of judging in some manner or another in a majority or dissenting opinion. Each decision, decision to a greater or lesser degree also proves true Justice Sotomayor's obvious truism that judges are indeed policymakers, and along with this the personality of the judge can in fact matter a great deal. None was decided in my mind by the application of precedent, plain text or original meaning. Each reworked policy in a significant area of American law. But each decision, I also think, demonstrates the deep discomfort our high court uh, has with this fact of judicial life and the fear of judging that characterizes our legal age. Each is in, so, in some way wants to deny judges the power to and responsibility for judging. Without further introduction, let me turn to the first of these cases, Ashcroft versus Iqbal. Here's the issue in the case. When are the allegations in the plaintiff's complaint plausible, such that they satisfy the pleasing standard set forth in Rule 8 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure? Early in the 20th century, law students did not take courses in civil procedure. They took courses in pleading. Under the old common law and code system, systems that were in place before the 1938 federal rules, pleading was the name of the game for civil litigation. Highly technical regulations prescribed exactly what a plaintiff, for example, had to put in his or her complaint at the outset of a case. A lot of factual detail was necessary to buttress allegations in order for a complaint to pass muster. Most importantly, many cases were dismissed at the pleading threshold. The actual evidentiary weight of the case didn't particularly matter. Rather, what determined the fate of the case was a lawyer's ability to conform pleadings to technical requirements and a plaintiff's ability to marshal evidence at the outset of the case in advance of discovery. The federal rules of 1938 rested on the premise that each procedural rule should do the job it is best functionally suited to perform. Pleading rules, the authors of the 1938 rules believed, were not well suited for case disposition. Why? Well, for a simple reason, parties don't have access to the evidence necessary to prove their allegations at the outset of the case. They need discovery to know the facts. Pleadings can do little more than inform an adversary the rough contours of a case, and little more than inform the court of what the case is about. Accordingly, the 1938 authors adopted a pleading requirement that required very little of the parties. Rule 8 only mandates a short and plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief. 
Well, these are cryptic words. What do they mean? To ch quote Charles Clark, one of the, of the primary author of the 1938 rules, what he said in 1938 as he advocated for these rules in front of a group of lawyers like yourselves, if the defendant knows of the affair or transaction to be litigated, and if the court has an idea of the broad outlines of the case, the claim is adequately pleaded. It is not the function of the pleadings to prove your case, Clark said. The factual sufficiency of a, of a pleader's case would be determined later on. By su surpassing a minimal pleading threshold, a plaintiff could gain access to the powerful discovery rules that federal rules provide for. Gather evidence, the court can then best resolve the case based on what actually happened between the parties. It is commonplace nowadays to deride Rule 8's minimal pleading threshold as an era unsuited, as, I'm sorry, as a relic unsuited for an era of complex litigation that imposes high costs on, on the parties. Litigation, it's unsuited for an era where plaintiffs allegedly routinely take advantage of the low pleading threshold to file frivolous cases, get to discovery, then saddle their adversary with extreme costs, and thereby extort a blackmail settlement. But litigation in the 1930s was not as innocent as, we may, as it may seem today. The elite lawyers who authored the federal rules were precisely those who practiced in areas of corporate reorganization and shareholder derivative suits that were oftentimes extraordinarily uh, expensive and, and, and uh, burdensome. Moreover, they anticipated these problems that, the, that a minimal pleading threshold might, uh, might create in a world of complex litigation, the blackmail suit, for example. What was their response? The 1938 authors responded to the alleged problems the minimal pleading threshold would impose. By, with, with faith in judges. The discovery rules, Rule 16, these empower judges to control litigation, to steer it and manage it towards a, an efficient resolution. The idea was that the active and involved judge, fully informed by actual evidence, not just the allegations of the parties, can make decisions both to protect parties against abuses of the litigation process, as well as ensure that cases, that what decides cases are the substantive merits. It is this faith in judges that I believe is the linchpin of the federal rule system and the system of pleading that it contains. Rule 8's short and plain statement requirement may not be pristinely clear to our ears, but it was clear to the ears of, the, of, of lawyers in 1938. Moreover, the Supreme Court clarified its meaning in 1957 with the well-known Conley versus Gibson decision. The court reaffirmed the accepted rule that a complaint should not be dismissed for failure to state a claim unless it appears beyond doubt that the plaintiff can prove no set of facts in support of his claim which would entitle him to relief. We presume plaintiff's allegations are true, draw all inferences in favor of the plaintiff from those allegations. And if those allegations and those inferences add up to the possibility that the defendant might be liable if a set of facts were discovered to establish that liability, the claim is adequately pleaded, the parties can go to discovery. This interpretation lasted until 2007, when after repeating, repeatedly reaffirming Conley, the court dramatically jettisoned it in Bell Atlantic versus Twombly. And in an abysmally written, hopelessly muddled opinion by Justice Souter, the court rejected Conley's no set of facts standard. Instead, the complaint must plausibly allege a claim. What does plausible mean? Nobody actually knows. But one thing is certain for sure. It's no longer sufficient if the plaintiff's claim is possible. Plausibility pleading invites judges at the outset of cases to consider how convincing the allegations are without the benefit of actual evidence. What drove this decision? The court stressed costs of litigation, the burden discovery imposes on the defendant, and the fact that a minimal pleading threshold enables plaintiffs to create these costs too easily. What about faith in judges? What about the foundational premise of the federal rules that the active and involved judge will protect against abuses while ensuring a substantively just decision? Without reference to a single relevant empirical study in the opinion, and without drawing upon a single relevant empirical study cited in any of the almost dozen amicus briefs filed in support of Bell Atlantic, the court insisted that the cost of discovery led to blackmail settlements, and the notion that careful case management could avoid these abuses is unfounded. Twombly generated quite a lot of confusion, it also, which is important because it's now the 11th most cited Supreme Court case in history with 17,000 citations in two years. Ashcroft versus Iqbal is the court's first attempt to clarify what the plausibility pleading threshold means. The facts are these. Uh, Javed Iqbal, a Pakistani Muslim, was arrested after 9-11 and detained in a federal facility in Brooklyn as a person of high interest. His conditions of detention, according to his allegations, were pretty horrible. He was beaten. He was uh, uh, in solitary confinement for long stretches of time. He was unable to practice his religion. He was convicted of a few immigration-related offenses, deported, sent to Pakistan. He then filed a lawsuit against 40 officials, ranging all the way from the corrections officers who, who were in, actually in the facility in Brooklyn, all the way up the chain to John Ashcroft, then the Attorney General, and Robert Mueller, then the Director of the FBI. He alleged that he was designated a person of high interest on account of his race, religion, or national origin, and he alleged that he was subjected to harsh conditions for the same discriminatory reason. He alleged in his complaint that Ashcroft was, quote, the principal architect of the policy pursuant to which he was detained, and that Mueller was instrumental in its execution. 
He also alleged that both men knew of and condoned his harsh treatment because of his race, national origin, or religion. Ashcroft and Mueller moved to dismiss and said that the complaint inadequately alleged their personal involvement in or approval of his, uh, his harsh detention. The Second Circuit applying Twombly said it's plausible after 9-11 that high-ranking officials were actually involved in, uh, they, were, they were involved or aware of what was unfolding in New York, and they, could, in fact, may have condoned the treatment of Iqbal. Uh, this, we must, we'll have to figure, learn that through the process of discovery. Ashcroft and Mueller voiced the concern that a low pleading threshold would enable people to file suits against high-ranking government officials too easily, dragging them into court, forcing them to respond to discovery requests and the like, taking them away from their duties, and thereby vitiating the policy behind official immunity. The Second Circuit responded with faith in judges, the same faith as the 1938 framers. A judge could carefully stagger discovery the Second Circuit suggested, allowing the case to go forward against lower-ranking officials, and only allowing the case then to proceed against Ashcroft and Mueller if evidence is unearthed in the first stage that suggests more personal involvement than the allegations uh, themselves. The Supreme Court reversed. The court took pains to clarify Twombly, and in so doing created the Twombly two-step, uh, uh, the mechanism for assessing, or the, the process for assessing allegations at the Rule 8 stage. First, give no credit to conclusory allegations. The court ignored allegations that the Ashcroft and Mueller knew of, condoned, and willfully and maliciously agreed to subject Iqbal to harsh treatment, um, <clears throat> harsh conditions of confinement on account of his religion or race. The court said these are just conclusory allegations and do not warrant a presumption of truth. After getting rid of the conclusory allegations, the second step is to look at the remaining allegations and see if the plaintiff's claim is plausible. Here, while the allegations that Ashcroft and Mueller cleared and approved his of Iqbal's conditions of confinement for racially discriminatory grounds. Maybe those allegations could be possibly correct. It might, it might be possibly correct that these two men did, in fact, create a policy, racially discriminatory policy of harsh treatment of detainees. It's simply not plausible. The more plausible explanation, Justice Kennedy said, writing for a five-member majority, is that these men were motivated by the non-discriminatory intent to detain aliens illegally in the United States on, as an anti-terrorism measure. Why is this explanation more plausible than the discriminatory one? Who says it's more plausible? On what grounds? Justice Kennedy gives us an answer. Writing again for the five-member majority, he said, a judge applying judicial experience and common sense can examine allegations of complaint and reach this conclusion. Perhaps the more innocuous explanation of Ashcroft and Mueller's behavior is right, perhaps not. We'll never know because there will not be any discovery in this case. Courts are supposed to judge the factual likelihood of what the plaintiff experienced or alleged to experience, not on the basis of evidence, but on the basis of allegations. In other words, short of a leak from the Attorney General's office or a whistleblower coming forward, I find it hard to believe that any plaintiff could meet the plausibility threshold the court set for the type of allegations that Iqbal uh, uh, included. What about faith in judges? Why not let this case go forward, rely on judicial wisdom, and the careful management of discovery to minimize the sorts of the cost that Ashcroft and Mueller uh, feared? Here, the Second Circuit mapped this way forward. So high-ranking officials like these two men wouldn't be sitting in depositions, wouldn't be, uh, have to respond to interrogatories unless there were a factually, factual basis to doing, for doing so. The Supreme Court said, no, we reject the, quote, careful case management approach. This doesn't work to pr protect high-ranking officials against the burdens of litigation. Again, no single relevant empirical study to buttress this conclusion. Iqbal, in my mind, is a sad opinion. It means the final rejection of the vision of the 1938 authors, of a system designed with the hope that enlightened judicial involvement will render litigation system not only efficient, but also substantively just. The message I take from the case is, for, for fear of unspecified and largely speculative costs, we're willing to jettison the, uh, the, the search for the truth that the 1938 framers envisioned. We're willing to jettison our faith in judges. In one sense, Iqbal empowers judges to decide. It gives them more flexibility at the motion to dismiss stage than they enjoyed under Conley to evaluate allegations and weigh the plausible, the, the factual likelihood of what the plaintiff says. But this judicial empowerment, I believe, is somewhat of a false one or an illusory one. Most complaints in most types of cases will come adequately pleaded. That's just a matter of fact. An ordinary automobile negligence case, it's going to be, it'll be fairly easy for the plaintiff to meet the plausibility threshold. But certain cases routinely will lack the factual detail that Twombly and now Iqbal require. Particularly, I think, civil rights cases where it's important for the plaintiff to allege facts showing the intent or motive of the defendant. How is the plaintiff supposed to do this without discovery? These case dismissals will become, I think, in some of these cases, almost automatic. Um, it will be a refl reflexive reaction to a perception that these cases are out of control and need to be cut off at the pleading stage. What this case is really ab about, I think, is fear of judging, fear of discretion in the hands of trial judges to manage cases, a collapse in the faith that if judges do their jobs right, we don't need unforgiving, harsh procedural requirements to ensure efficient, substantively just litigation. Now I'll let uh, everybody else tell me why I'm wrong.
Mr. Gar, would you like to, since you argued the case? Sure. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you for being here and wish you all a happy Constitution Day. Um, I have to say I was somewhat disheartened when I um, told my wife where I was going and why I was going here. I said, well, it's the panel for Constitution Day. And she said, really? Constitution Day? Is there such a thing? Well, uh, there is, and I'm, I'm glad that all of you are here to, uh, to celebrate it. Um, I, I agree with some of the things that Professor Marcus said, Marcus said about the Iqbal decision. I mean, the, I think the first thing to understand about the case is it is widely regarded as the sleeper decision of the prior Supreme Court term. Um, not many, or a lot of people were following it, but certainly not as many people were following the case. It was a very important case to the federal government, um, but because of the, the breadth of the court's decision and its interpretation of the federal rules of civil procedure, it is a, a now a, one of the gateway requirements for getting into federal court. And so I think you will see it being one of the, certainly one of the most cited decisions of the past term and perhaps one of the most cited decisions in recent history. Um, the second thing I agree with is I think um, it's quite true that the court has come a long way um, from Conley versus Gibson, the case that was decided many decades ago interpreting um, the federal rules of civil procedure, which said that in order to get into federal court, um, no, no complaint can be dismissed unless it's beyond doubt that the plaintiff can prove no set of facts in support of the claim. Um, and that, that's, that's a, a, a very uh, pro-plaintiff standard. Um, and under that standard, I think almost any complaint would pass the dismissal stage and, and uh, under the federal rules, therefore, be entitled to discovery. The Supreme Court disavowed that standard, um, I, I think, uh, unanimous, unanimously in the Twombly case, or at least was by a wide margin, and said that that wasn't um, an accurate statement of the, the federal rules of civil procedure. Um, and, and I think um, determined that you had to plead something closer to plausibility, um, and that's how we got to the Iqbal case. Uh, now, I do disagree with Professor Marcus um, that uh, Iqbal takes away the authority of the federal judges to screen cases through discovery. Um, I think the federal rules make it quite clear that first you have to get past Federal Rules Civil Procedure 8, which requires a, a short, plain statement of relief, and then you get to discovery. You don't get to go into court and say, well, I think something might be wrong. I get to use the judicial arms of the discovery process and subject defendants to uh, discovery, which can be expensive and time consuming, whether it's for a private individual or government. You've got to go into court. You've got to make this, ba make this basic threshold showing, and then you get to discovery, and then you can have courts ferret out which, what types of discovery uh, is appropriate. And the, the Twombly case made that quite clear, that first you had to pass Rule 8, and then you would get into discovery. And the Iqbal decision, uh, I think properly, the court properly declined to go back on what it said in uh, Twombly on that. Um, you know, I, I think in some respects, if you look at the complaint in the Iqbal case, uh, I think it is an unremarkable complaint, uh, un unremarkable result, or at least it ought to be an un unremarkable result under the federal rules of civil, civil procedure. Uh, the complaint in the case as pertained to the Attorney General of the United States and the director of the FBI um, alleged that the government had adopted a policy of holding uh, those determined to be suspects, determined by the FBI to be suspects in the 9-11 investigation until they had been cleared. Um, well, I hope so. I mean, I, I hope the government, um, when it had people in its custody in the wake of the 9-11 attacks and determined that they were suspects in the investigation, held them before releasing them. And, and I think the court um, properly recognized that there was, there was absolutely nothing unlawful about that allegation. Um, uh, the second set of allegations alleged that uh, the plaintiff in this case um, had been unfairly, un uh, wrongly um, classified as a suspect um, in the 9-11 investigation. But the, co the complaint quite clearly um, laid that act um, to the lower level officials that had actually conducted the screening. Um, everyone agreed and the complaint didn't allege that the Attorney General, the Director of the FBI, were somehow involved in screening of 9-11 suspects. I mean, those officials are always extraordinarily busy, and certainly in the wake of the 9-11 attacks, they were particularly busy. Um, and, and so you have a complaint that 
then took those two facts but had a, an additional allegation that nevertheless the Attorney General of the United States and the Director of the FBI were aware of this, condoned it, and ought to be responsible for it. Um, and, and I think uh, the court uh, properly concluded that that allegation uh, failed uh, Rule 8, and I think that that kind of allegation ought to fail Rule 8 um, uh, under Twombly, and, and uh, you know, I think that part of the court's decision um, ought to be unremarkable. Nevertheless, I agree with Professor Markets that the court's decision um, in interpreting Rule 8 uh, is very important and may have far-reaching uh, effects on civil litigation in the federal courts. The court has now moved to this plausibility standard uh, where you have to you have to show, if you're a plaintiff, that a complaint crosses the line from possibility that the allegations of unlawful conduct were possible in a given situation to plausible. Uh, and, and I think that was a line that, that was initially drawn by Justice Souter in the decision in Twombly. It's a line that has been flushed out a little bit more in the Iqbal case, but I think it's going to be a line that the courts are going to be interpreting and perhaps in some cases struggling with um, for some time. And so maybe I'll just stop right there. Well, I, I agree with uh, both General Dar and Professor Marcus that it is a very significant case, and I think it's a case uh, the significance of which proved to be much greater than the government anticipated because the government, I, from my perspective, argued a, a relatively narrow approach. The case was essentially about the pleading requirements for claims against high-level government officials who enjoy um, qualified or absolute immunity, depending on the circumstances. Uh, they did not pose this as a case about revolutionizing the pleading rules. Um, the, the case, I think, is unsettling or destabilizing in several respects. Uh, an open question after Twombly was whether that case was somehow grounded in the substantive law of antitrust. Because one thing Justice Souter concluded in the case was that if you focused on those facts that had been pled in Twombly, there was a possible consistency with illegal conduct under the antitrust laws, but it was just as plausible that the facts alleged described innocent conduct. And it was in that situation that he said that kind of complaint failed to satisfy Rule 8. Well, Iqbal clearly says that Twombly is not limited to the antitrust context, that courts generally have to assess, once you've pared away the conclusory allegations, courts generally have to assess whether those facts that remain that are well pleaded state a plausible claim for relief. That in itself creates a series of questions. Um, there's a debate in Iqbal between Justice Kennedy and Justice Souter over what it means for uh, something to be plausible. Justice Souter accuses Justice Kennedy of assessing whether the facts are likely true or not. But Kennedy, I think, tries to be careful to hew to the sort of Twombly approach and say that, well, I'm going to take as true the facts that are pled, but those facts have a innocent explanation that is just as likely as an explanation describing unlawful or tortious conduct, and therefore it doesn't satisfy the pleading standard. But that question of how you assess plausibility is something courts are going to struggle with. Second thing that I think is destabilizing about, about the case is, um, as you all probably know, most states model their procedural rules on the federal rules of procedure. So just as after Twombly, state courts had to struggle with whether they were going to reassess their own interpretation of Rule 8, that likely will now happen after Iqbal, particularly given that it's clear that, it, that Twombly is not limited just to the antitrust context. Um, my third point, and, I, and I'll stop with this, is there is a reading of Iqbal that would regard it as empowering to district judges as opposed to reflecting some fear or distrust of the judges. Um, if you looked at the old Conley v. Gibson standard, no set of facts, it's beyond doubt that there's no set of facts that would entitle a plaintiff to relief. You could regard that as constraining because it prevents judges from clearing off their docket cases that look pretty far-fetched. But you, you know, it's hard to say that if you were going to sincerely apply the Conley v. Gibson standard, 
you know, it's beyond doubt that there are no set of facts that would entitle the plaintiff to relief. What, what Twomley and Iqbal arguably do is give district judges greater authority to dismiss cases at the front end before they start taking up not just the time and the resources of the opposing party, but the courts themselves with discovery and subsequent motion practice. And, and one way I think of looking at, at the Twombly-Iqbal cases together is they're not so much about antitrust law or the law of uh, high-level government officials in Bivens actions. They're about the ability of district court judges to, at the front end of cases, dispose of, of complaints that some people may think are um, tend to be frivolous. Um, I think if you ask some district judges, they would say that where this is really going to have a lot of impact is in civil cases involving 1983 actions and in civil cases involving <coughs> habeas petitions. Um, and whether that's desirable or not from a policy point of view, you could, you could debate um, intensely. So. Well, I guess I have I have a chance to, to say a couple more things. Um, I think that Justice Bales is, is absolutely right that, in a sense, the Iqbal case is uh, empowering, uh, and th in, in, in that sense, somewhat inconsistent with the overarching themes that I, uh, I suggested characterize these cases. And I, I have to confess that I, I did recognize that, and I decided I would better be just to go sort of blaze ahead. And, and I liked what I had written for the introduction and didn't want to revise it. So, but, but I think that the, the way that the cases are, is empowering is, again, along the lines of what Justice Bell said, it, I agree with. But I think it's, it's going to be empowering um, in an almost somewhat mechanistic way that uh, having clerked for a district judge and knowing the burden that civil rights, prisoner civil rights cases in particular, pose on the district judge's docket, I, docket, I think the temptation to use Iqbal for many district judges as an almost mechanistic way of disposing of these cases um, uh, is, is going to be uh, quite, that's going to be hard to resist. I also question whether the wisdom of the, uh, the way in which the case is empowering, it encourages judges to decide uh, based on, again, allegations, not, not anything more than that. Uh, as for, there, there's something that General Gar said that I wanted to respond to because I, sp I spent the last two years of my life in uh, increasing agony thinking about Charles Clark, the original author of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. I started out very excited about this and by the end I wanted to beat my, my head on the ground. I took the picture of Clark that I posted up on my, my, de my wall. I took it down a couple months ago because I could no longer bear to look at it. Um, Charles Clark, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that, that Conley was the correct interpretation of Rule 8, at least as originally intended. Clark referred to the Conley decision as a pretty good decision. Um, Clark uh, wanted to get rid of the motion to dismiss altogether and not allow cases to be taken care of at the, at the pleading stage at all. He was uh, convinced he, the other authors of the 1938 rules backed him down from that position. But um, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that, 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 the, uh, that what these guys in 1938 wanted with Rule 8 was what the Conley court said. And so that, that and one more piece of evidence for that, if you look at Form 11, which is in the federal rules, the end of the federal rules, it's the form complaint for pleading an automobile negligence case. The complaint basically says the de defendant negligently drove a, an automobile against the plaintiff. Well, negligently is a conclusory allegation. There's no facts suggesting the defendant was negligent. There's, no, there's nothing alleged that the defendant was drunk or, was, uh, or ran a red light. So if you take that, that negligently out of the complaint, you're left with the defendant drove a car against the plaintiff. And there are many innocent explanations for why a defendant might get into a car accident with a plaintiff that fall well short of negligence. I'm not convinced that under that an honest uh, that if the court the court claims that the form complaints are still allowed in the rules, but I'm not convinced that that's, one can square that with what the court said. Um, but 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 the the other question is why would the why did the court think it was so? So if I'm correct about what form what the rule eight originally meant. Why is it the court's job to revise it judicially? There's a mechanism for reworking the federal rules of civil procedure. If it is indeed the case that we need a heightened pleading requirement in cases involving high-ranking government officials, or if it is indeed the case, more generally, that the low pleading threshold is saddling defendants with unjustified and unwarranted discovery costs, then there's a mechanism for changing this. It's the, the uh, rulemaking process. Um, it's a more democratic and open uh, process. It's one that's more amenable to, uh, to, the, to the reflection, uh, more amenable to the use of empirical data and the like than the, than the, the common law rulemaking process that the court undertook in Twombly. Uh, the court had been consistent uh, in, in previous Rule 8 decisions 
1993, in 2002, it consistently said the process for changing the rules is the rulemaking process. So I, I'm, I'm puzzled as to why the court decided in Twombly and then in Iqbal to, to back away from that and to, to take, take, to take up the, um, the mantle of rule change uh, itself. Mr. Garth? Oh, sure. Um, well, you know, it, it's an interesting point about the court's role in interpreting the federal rules of civil procedure. I mean, I think there is a sense in which the court feels as though it has a broader degree of authority in interpreting those rules than, say, a statute. And I think Professor Marcus is quite right that, that there is a process for amending the rules and one could take the position that um, the Supreme Court ought to be just as careful in interpreting the federal rules of civil procedure as they should a statute. And yet uh, one of the things that's difficult about litigating these cases is that there is very little evidence of the history of these rules um, and uh, you know what, uh, what the original founders might have thought about decisions afterwards. I mean, I'm not sure that that's despite what kind of weight that ought to be given, but the fact is that there is very little evidence to go by. Uh, and so you have these decisions where the Supreme Court is interpreting these rules without much precedent to play with. Um, I do think that a large majority of the court has reached the point that they feel that they needed to revisit this area. I think that was evident in Twombly, and that was obviously evident in the Iqbal case. Um, there's, a, there's a disagreement among the court now about the interpretation of uh, Rule 8, but, but I think the court clearly felt that it had to get back into this area. And in that respect, I think it's important that the federal court system today um, obviously looks much different than it did when the rules were initially passed. Um, the last thing I would say, which we haven't focused on as much, is there's another component to the Iqbal decision, which I think is quite important. The court emphasized it in the Twombly case and reiterated it in Iqbal, which is that in evaluating the sufficiency of the pleadings, you have to take into account the context uh, and, and the underlying legal claims. And so in Twombly, it was a, the antitrust law, and here it was the qualified immunity law and the particular type of officials here. So while the Iqbal decision, I think, is properly construed as a broad decision interpreting federal aid and applying to all civil litigation, in order to understand the case, I think you really have to understand that these claims were brought against these high-ranking officials. Um, and, and I think the court, as it emphasized in its opinion, found it particularly implausible that the Attorney General of the United States would have been involved in this kind of line decision uh, and particularly threatening um, to the operation of, of government to subject someone like the Attorney General of the United States to these types of claims. After all, if it is the case that all one plaintiff has to do to get uh, a deposition from the Attorney General or even just an interrogatory is to say, you know, this uh, prison official did this thing wrong to me and oh, by the way, the Attorney General of the United States knew of, condoned, and uh, approved of this practice, uh, then I don't think it's much of a stretch to conclude that the Attorney General would be subjected to thousands of demands of discovery because whether right or wrong, I think uh, many litigants would, would include those claims. And in fact, after Twombly, there were those types of claims brought where to give you one example, uh, a prisoner was moved from one state to another and added a claim that the Attorney General ought to be held accountable for that um, decision, which is just an absolutely, is, is a general common sense matter of how the Department of Justice works, is absolutely absurd. Yet, a district court held um, that it, that claim should not be dismissed and that the case could go forward to discovery, leaving it up to, as Justice Scalia emphasized during the argument in this case, the whim of, of you know, any of the 600 district court judges in the nation to decide what discovery was appropriate um, for a high-ranking official like that. So I think in order to understand the, the Iqbal decision, it's important to keep those considerations in mind, even though the case obviously has, has broader implications. Well, first, I think, and, and General Gar touched on this, the substantive side of Iqbal is also going to be very important because one thing the court did was reject the possibility of supervisory liability in Bivens cases it did that based on its interpretation of Section 1983 law. So I think the, the logical inference is what the court's really saying is in Section 1983 actions, not only is there not respondeat superior, but there's also not supervisory liability unless the supervisor sued themselves engaged in actionable misconduct. I mean, the court says uh, each individual is only liable for their own misconduct. And given the volume of 1983 actions across the courts and given how they often involve uh, 
you know, entities from prisons to police departments. This, this n narrowing of, of supervisory liability in a way that does cut back from what many of the Federal Court of Appeals had done, that could be very significant in terms of its impact on cases. Um, other point, um, as I was listening to Professor Marcus, it struck me that the, this case, along with Twombly, may be part of what will be to the Roberts Court with respect to Rule 12b-6. It will be for them as what happened in the 1980s under the Rehnquist Court with regard to Rule 56 and motions for summary judgment. You may remember the so-called trilogy, which basically enabled district courts to more readily grant summary judgment. Um, and I suspect that in this area, with regard to 12b-6 motions and pleadings, we're probably missing at least one more case. That w in order to understand what this all means, we, we probably need at least a trilogy, if not something greater. I think we have time for just a couple of questions, if any of you have questions for the panelists. Yes. I, your question is, I just want to repeat it so the tape can get it, whether there would be a cause of action for a prisoner who didn't know about this decision and didn't have access to a library and so then couldn't conform his or her complaint to the pleading. Um, it's kind of a specific question, so I'll just direct that to our civil procedure expert. <laughs> you, can, you can have me uh, make mistakes in my answers anytime you want. Uh, uh, we benefit from the expertise. You know, I, I, I don't see why a prisoner would be uh, held to a, a lesser standard. Often, my, my limited experience with prisoner complaints was in my years as, as a district court clerk, and um, there was, I think that these problems were handled a little bit more informally, uh, oftentimes with a pro se staff attorney at the court, which would, who would then liaison with the prisoner if, there was, if the complaint had any facial plausibility to try to help the prisoner come up with a slightly more um, a detailed complaint. So, so, but I, I can't see any reason why, um, I, I think that a court would probably bend over backwards to read a complaint in the light most favorable to a pro se litigant, but short of that, I don't see why Rule 8 would, uh, would, would uh, bend in that context. I mean, I guess I understood there to be two parts of the question. If, if a prison did deny prisoners access to a law library, then that would violate their constitutional rights under the First Amendment as interpreted by the court. If the claim is the prisoner just didn't know about Iqbal, there was a library, he had access to it, um, then, then I think, um, um, fair or not, the prisoner would, would be held accountable for that. But I, I agree with Professor Marcus that um, complaints by prisoners are, are liberally construed. Other questions? Yes. The question is whether the panelists think there's some internal conflict on the court because the Twombly decision was written by Justice Souter and it was a 7-2 decision and in Iqbal it was a 5-4 decision and Justice Souter wrote the dissent. Mr. Garr? I think there absolutely is. I mean, I think if, if you look at the transcript of the oral argument, um, there was a, a, a very heated back and forth between the justices about what Twombly meant and I spent a great deal of my 30 minutes uh, in a wonderful colloquy with Justice Souter about what Twombly meant, and, and he made quite clear what he meant. Um, and, it, and it wasn't what the court said in, in the Iqbal case, so I think there is quite a disagreement. I mean, I think it sort of underscores that uh, justices, like all of us, have to be careful what we say, because, uh, you know, Justice Souter said that in the context of Twombly, um, which, you know, he viewed as a very uh, concrete antitrust issue and a specific problem presented there, and the court took the language in that context um, and said that, no, this applies to all civil pleadings. And, and there are five justices who agree with that and, and four who I think probably pretty strenuously disagree with it. And there are four if, if you assume that Justice uh, Sotomayor would be in the camp. 
Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. The question is whether Iqbal in, sets up a de facto um, absolute immunity because a plaintiff faced with this standard would never be able to plead facts that would meet the standard in this sort of case. Right. Um, that's a good question. In fact, at, at the tail end of my argument, I got a question from Justice Stevens on similar point of what about Jones versus Clinton. Um, I, I think to understand that why the cases are different, um, President Clinton as far as I know, didn't dispute that uh, he had a relationship or knew Paula Jones and that there was something going on there. Of course, he denied the legal allegations. Um, here, the question was the pre whether the Attorney General of the United States had any involvement um, with line decisions that were made by people that or the Attorney General ordinarily would have no direct communication with. So the, if you look at it from the standpoint of plausibility, um, I think there was little question in, in Jones versus Clinton that, that the basic claims that there was something going on there were plausible, the question of whether that was a legal claim or not, whereas here the question was, um, is it plausible that the, the Attorney General of the United States was involved in this type of decision? Um, as to the second question about how would they get facts about these things, um, first of all, the Iqbal complaint um, can proceed. It went back so that he can amend it and try to supplement his allegations. Um, but the other claims against the lower level officials, the guards in the prison, um, the um, the prison wardens, um, higher ranking officials, um, those claims are going forward. Uh, it, it's only the claims against the Attorney General of the United States and the FBI director that are not going forward. And so then the question is, well, what, what does a civil rights plaintiff or, or prisoner do in this situation? Well, you've got to come into court and you've got to come up with some reason that would make it plausible to believe that the Attorney General of the United States amidst all of the things that he's doing, would know about what happened to Joe Smith in a prison in New York on a given day. Um, and you know, just saying that the Attorney General of the United States knew of, condoned of, or approved this is not going to get you the right to dispose of the Attorney General. You've got to come up with some other particular thing to know about. Um, the last thing I would add is that the plaintiff in this case um, is in uh, a particularly bad position to complain about that because he had the benefit of a 200-page uh, Inspector General report written about the 9-11 investigation, um, which conducted a lot of what otherwise would have been discovery um, into this, and, and yet he wasn't able to come up with pleadings um, that were sufficient. And I guess the, I, I lied, this isn't the last, the last thing I will say is that, you know, oftentimes information comes out during discovery. You, you depose the, the, uh, the person who um, allegedly discriminated against you in your cell, and, and one of the questions is, well, who told you to do that? And he says, well, I got a memo from the Attorney General. Well, okay, you amend your complaint and say the Attorney General of the United States told him to do that. There you have a valid claim. Um, so oftentimes discovery against the lower level officials will result in information that will allow you to amend your pleadings and build your case. Um, and, and I think uh, disagreeing with Professor Marcus, I think um, that's a personal reasonable, uh, perfectly reasonable way to construe the federal civil rules of, of procedure. Thank you. I think we're about ready to move on to the next case. Professor Marcus. <clears throat> Caperton versus Massey reminds me of Jacobellus versus Ohio, a famous, the famous case where Potter Stewart, unable to articulate a definition of suppressible obscenity, simply threw up his hands and said, I know it when I see it. Caperton is about judicial elections and not steamy sex scenes in movies, but it's just as interesting and exciting. Well, maybe for a law professor or someone who's deeply sexually repressed, I'm not suggesting either description actually applies to me. <laughs> In the end, the court decides this case, I think, with an I know it when I see it standard. 
This case, more than any other we'll discuss today, illustrates the fact that at some point, rules cannot generate all the answers and judges will simply have to judge. This case also provoked one of the most the loudest and in my mind most ridiculous lamentations that judges might have to judge for, that I know of in Supreme Court jurisprudence in the dissenting opinion. Before I delve into the facts, let me give you some, some history. First, a little tiny bit of personal history. I once knew an English judge. He was the father of an of a, uh, English girl that I spent an entire year with in incredible comic futility trying to get to go out on a date with me. Uh, she never said yes, but I did get a chance to talk to him once, and he said, he, he found out I was going to law school and said, he's a high-ranking member of the English judiciary. He found out that I was going to law school and gave me an hour-long lecture on the inanity of electing judges. His criticism was obvious. Judges are supposed to be impartial and neutral. How can they be so if they have to run for office? Interestingly, states first turned to judicial elections uh, not to, as a way to, to combat corruption, uh, to, uh, to increase judicial independence and make judging more legitimate. In 1832, only one state, Mississippi, held judicial elections. Between 1846 and 53, 20 additional states amended their constitutions to require judges to be elected. Why did this happen? In 1837, there was a huge economic depression that began. The idea was that uh, a lot of people believed that state legislators and governors had entered into corrupt and shady land deals with speculators that had bankrupted state treasuries when the boom went bust. The idea was to try to take power away from state legislators and governors to make state government less corrupt. One way to do this was to amend the Constitution to require that judges be elected rather than being confirmed, appointed and confirmed by the political branches. Judges less beholden to cronies and other branches would be independent and more public-minded. They'd be more likely to strike down corrupt legislation. Elections would create judicial independence and, and uh, not undermine it. Well, we've come a long way since 1837. Judicial elections are seen, and I think correctly, uh, as increasingly seen as the essence of, of, of political corruption. Uh, first of all, they're much more expensive, and the expense has been ratcheted up dramatically over the last several years. So in 2000, if you wanted to run for, say, uh, Chief Justiceship of the Georgia Supreme Court, it would cost you about $38,000. Uh, and then in 2006, the National Association of Manufacturers spent $1.6 million trying to defeat a sitting justice on the Georgia Supreme Court. Uh, and it seems that these campaign contributions are having some effect. The New York Times did a study of the Ohio Supreme Court in 2004 and, and found that 70% of the time justices voted in favor of parties who were campaign contributors. The Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court very recently pleaded with the state to adopt, the state legislature to adopt a version of the Arizona retention system that we have in this state rather than the judicial elections that the state suffers from. The Chief Justice noted that 80% of Texans in a recent poll believe that judges can be purchased through campaign contributions and the Chief Justice feared the harm that this might uh, cause to the perception of judicial and legal legitimacy in the state. This all leads us to the West Virginia and the bitter judicial election of 2004. The story really begins in 1993 with a man named Hugh Caperton. Mr. Caperton purchased a mine in West Virginia, a coal mine, and made it a very profitable operation. He attracted the attention of Don Blankenship, CEO of A.T. Massey Coal Company, a Richmond, Virginia-based entity. Blankenship wanted to buy Caperton's mine, but Caperton refused to sell, so Blankenship played hardball. He bought up the land around the mine to try to cut off road and rail access to the mine. His company stole away Caperton's biggest customer by entering into a sweetheart coal deal. Caperton hollered uncle in 1998 and finally agreed to sell. But at 2 o'clock p.m. on the afternoon of the day of closing, Blankenship and Massey walked away from the, the table. Caperton was left high and dry. He did, went bankrupt. Caperton sued Massey for fraud and tortious interference with contractual relations. The jury uh, found for Caperton and ordered the Massey company to pay Caperton $50 million in compensatory and punitive damages. Massey appealed, and in 2004, the case went before the West Virginia Supreme Court. At the time, a liberal member of the West Virginia Supreme Court named Warren McGraw was up for re-election. Justice McGraw was a favorite of the trial, trial lawyers, the plaintiff's bar. He was associated with left-leaning uh, causes and, uh, and, and, uh, liber and labor unions and the like. His opponent uh, was a man named Brent Benjamin, a conservative corporate attorney. Uh, Benjamin uh, was the favorite candidate for Don Blankenship, the CEO of the Massey Company, who had several cases pending before the West Virginia Supreme, Supreme Court of Appeals at the time. One of the cases that, that Massey had before the court was the allegation, or the, or the jury found in the court below, that, that, uh, uh, that the Massey Company has essentially flooded the southern half of West Virginia. Uh, um, so, you know, it's, it's, he's got, a, Blankenship has a number of, of, of important cases before these just, justices. Um, Don Blankenship gave the, uh, the, the, gave $1,000 to Benjamin's campaign, which is the personal limit under the West Virginia campaign finance laws. But Don Blinkenship also created an independent 527 called And for the Sake of the Kids, created solely for the purpose of electing Don uh, Brent Benjamin to the court. 
uh, and for the sake of the kids, which benefited from $2.5 million of Blankenship's largesse, ran ads attacking Chief Justice McGraw for being soft on pedophiles, you know, everybody's favorite uh, tactic for smearing your political opponent. Um, the, the, the 527 also ran ads that had very little to do with children, including the following, which I'm going to read for you in my best evil voice, that in my mind is the very essence of chutzpah. Here it goes. Frivolous lawsuits are causing our car insurance bills to go higher and higher, 25% higher than some neighboring states. And Justice Warren McGraw and his greedy trial lawyer friends are to blame. The lawyers give McGraw thousands of campaign dollars and McGraw rules for them. <laughs> the lawyers get rich and you pay the price. Working families can't afford the high cost of car insurance or Warren McGraw, radical Warren McGraw, too high a cost for our families. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, the trial lawyers have Warren McGraw bought and paid for, so Don Blankenship tries to do the same with his own justice. Benjamin gets elected. The new court is now 4-3, essentially conservative versus liberal. Caperton versus Massey comes before it. Caperton asked Benjamin to recuse himself, sending the obvious fact that Benjamin had, uh, had benefited significantly from Don Blankenship's uh, uh, funding. Benjamin wrote an opinion denying his, the, the recusal motion and said no objective information exists to show that this justice has a bias. No objective information. The fact that he denied the recusal motion itself is prima facie evidence that he's biased because I would assert that any justice in this situation would see the obvious perception of bias that might, that might exist should the justice continue on the case, but uh, that's just me. The court ruled four and the five members of the majority opinion in this case. The court ruled four to three in favor of Massey and vacated the $50 million verdict on highly specious, specious grounds, I might add. Now, this is where things get really weird. Uh, Caperton moved for reconsideration, and while his motion was pending, two additional justices recused themselves from the West Virginia Supreme Court. One justice did so because photographs of him vacationing with Don Blankenship at, on, uh, in Monte Carlo surfaced, uh, photos that were from the time while the w Caperton versus Massey case was sub judice. Uh, another justice recused himself because after the original decision in the Caperton versus Massey case, the justice went on West Virginia television and referred to Don Blankenship as a stupid, evil man. Uh, so these two judges recused themselves. With a, <clears throat> with a couple of fill-in justices, the court again voted four to three to vacate the verdict. In other words, Benjamin cast the deciding vote two times. The issue before the Supreme Court was by failing to recuse himself, did Benjamin deprive Caperton of the right to a fair tribunal as guaranteed by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment? Justice Kennedy, writing for a 5-4 majority, said yes. For Kennedy, the issue is not whether Benjamin was actually biased. It's impossible to know whether he, he subjectively whether he was, in fact, biased. You can't really ask Benjamin, because if he was biased, it's highly unlikely he would say, oh, yes, I was biased. Rather, the test under the Due Process Clause is an objective one. The judge must assess, under a realistic appraisal of psychological tendencies and human weakness, whether there is a risk of bias. Kennedy says there is a serious risk of bias based on objective and reasonable perceptions when a person with a personal stake in a particular case had a significant and disproportionate influence in placing the judge on the case by raising funds or directing the judge's election campaign when the facts, I'm sorry, when the case was pending or imminent. Who? That is a long, very wordy test. Uh, how do you know when a, when a person had a significant and disproportionate influence in electing a judge? Uh, Justice Kennedy gives us a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, factors. Um, this includes the amount of money, the, the contributor spent, how close the election was, and so forth and so on. Here the test is met, Justice Kennedy said, the West Virginia Supreme Court judgment must be vacated. Now quite frankly, I think that Justice Kennedy's recusal threshold is vague and uncertain. Even, even though it's obvious in this case that Benjamin should have recused himself, I think, to most of us. We know it when we see it. That's all that I think Kennedy can basically say. Judges will have to judge. We can't just give you an automatic test. Life is too messy and uncertain, and you lower court judges will have to figure out what to do in this circumstance. And it is the open texture of this test for recusal under the due process clause that gets the four dissenters with Chief Justice Roberts writing for them all riled up. Chief Justice Roberts' dissent is a model of the chicken little style of legal argumentation. The sky is falling, the sky is falling, uh, all hell is going to break loose. Roberts insists that there must be a bright line rule to give guidance to judges. And he says the rule will be something like this. If a judge has a direct financial interest in the case, then the judge should recuse him or herself. Otherwise, uh, the due process clause doesn't speak to the situation. If the case doesn't fit the bright line rule, recusal can be a matter of statute or, or rule of professional conduct, but not the due process clause. The problem with the majority's so-called objective standard, Roberts says, is that it gives almost no guidance. And then Justice Roberts, rattle, Chief Justice Roberts rattles off a remarkable list of 40 questions left unanswered by Kennedy's test, such as how much money is too much money? What about a close personal friendship between the, between the litigant and the judge? Is that sufficient to require recusal? 
In other words, Chief Justice Roberts is shocked, shocked that Kennedy's opinion doesn't resolve all questions regarding judicial recusal and that Kennedy's threshold requires judges to judge based on individual cases. Interestingly, though, when Kennedy invokes judicial experience and common sense in the Iqbal case as to when a, what a judge uses to determine when claims are plausible, Chief Justice Roberts signals no disagreement, and I find that somewhat puzzling. But I'll stop there and turn the floor over. Justice Bales, would you like to go first this time? I'm reminded of yet another reason why I'm glad if I'm a judge, I'm in Arizona. <laughs> the, what, what one thing the case reflects is a troubling trend around the country for elections in those states that have contested races for judicial office to become more bitter, more partisan, much more expensive. I mean, it's not, I mean, West Virginia may be an extreme example, but around the country it's, it's becoming more frequent that millions of dollars will be spent on judicial races, particularly those for state Supreme Courts, and it's often groups putting money behind or against uh, judges that they hope will be sympathetic to their position. Um, the Caperton case, I think, first you have to ask, is it a case that is, is kind of limited to its facts? because Justice Kennedy says, I think, at least a half a dozen times that this is an extraordinary case, it's an exceptional case, um, it's an extreme case, and he even says at one point in the opinion that he's confident that it will be only in rare instances in which the standard that he uh, establishes for due process will, will be violated. So. I think a, an open question is whether this is a case just about the rare instance where somebody puts $3 million behind a judge who later votes for them in a huge uh, pending case. And it's a point that, that Justice Roberts notes in his dissent because the majority opinion is, is, must be deliberate. It's unclear on a basic question. Now, Justice Kennedy in the majority says that Due process is offended in certain circumstances where the probability of actual bias on the part of the judge is constitutionally intolerable. And he, he identifies the four factors that Professor Marcus quoted to determine that in this case the risk of actual bias was too high. But he doesn't say whether in other contexts there is a due process right to have a judge recuse themselves if you can somehow determine that the risk of actual bias is, in a constitutional sense, too high. So that's a very important open question. Um, another thing that the case illustrates is the tension, common tension in law, between those who like rules and those who like standards. Because Kennedy seems to have embraced a somewhat amorphous standard of this probability of actual bias for when recusal is required. States, in contrast, have increasingly been moving towards more specific sort of rule-based models for recusal. If someone is related to the judge to the third degree of affinity, they must recuse themselves from the case. If they've accepted campaign contributions in a certain amount from a party or the party's lawyer, they must remove themselves from the case. Um, and it may be that what Justice Kennedy is hoping is that by this standard uh, in its looseness that a response will occur first at the state level in terms of adopting more uh, specific standards for the or more specific rules for, for when recusal is mandatory on the part of judges. And that is something that's been developing around the country um, even, even prior to the Caperton decision. Uh, well, the first thing I would say is uh, whatever Justice Kennedy thought he gained in the Iqbal case by closing the courts to certain cases, he lost in this case by allowing, creating what is going to become, no, become known as the Caperton motion. And, and if, if the dissent is anywhere near correct, we're going to see many of those. And I think it's important to recognize that Justice Kennedy was the, the swing vote in these cases. Both decisions were 5-4 decisions. Um, and Justice Kennedy wrote both. Um, the second thing I would mention is I think the most significant decision the court may have made in this case uh, was the decision to take it at all. 
uh, as all of you know, the, the court's docket is almost entirely discretionary. The Supreme Court gets to decide what cases it takes and what cases it doesn't. Uh, and this case was up for certiorari, and the court relisted it, um, I think, something like four or five times, meaning that it couldn't make a decision. It kept postponing the decision, postponing the decision, postponing the decision, and ultimately they took it. Uh, and I think sometimes what you see in these sorts of um, extraordinary cases, extreme cases, that the court decides, even though the justices probably agree what happened was wrong, they decide this isn't really the case that we ought to make um, new law in. Um, but the court decided to take this case, and I think once they decided to take it, it seemed to, to me, and I think probably most people, that the handwriting was on the wall. Um, I, as for the majority's decision, or the, the decision in the case, I think it's important to recognize that um, I suspect that um, all of the justices thought that um, what was going on here was, was pretty rotten and shouldn't happen. I mean, a guy gets $3 million in um, money during the campaign and then sits on the very case and, and refuses to recuse himself. Um, but the legal issue before the court, the doctrinal issue before the court, um, was should this matter be um, resolved um, by the federal constitution? Uh, or is this the kind of matter that we ought to leave up to the states um, who can enact their own recusal laws um, and deal with this on a state-by-state -state basis? Um, and, and particularly since we're here at the Rehnquist Center, and this is something that was very near and dear to the chief, I think it's important to, to, to recognize that aspect of the case. The view of the dissenters was not that this was perfectly fine. Uh, it was, as, as Justice Scalia emphasized in his um, separate dissent, um, that the, the federal constitution uh, can't be the solution to every problem, um, that the states ought to come up with their own standards. Many states do have recusal standards. There's no reason why they can't get more stringent uh, recusal standards, and that we ought to leave it up to the states um, to adopt it. Um, the next thing I would say is, um, uh, uh, with respect to Professor Marcus, who, who's just summarizing the cases um, in defense of the Chief Justice, um, the Chief Justice didn't just say the standard ought to be whether there's a pecuniary interest or not. Um, in fact, if you look back over 200 years, um, uh, there were two instances in which the court had held that the federal constitution required recusal. Um, where a judge, the first is where a judge has a direct pecuniary interest in a matter. Uh, and the second is involved a unique uh, situation that comes up in the criminal contempt context where the same judge um, that found someone was in contempt as reviewing that case. It was very much the same judge's um, behavior that's at issue. And those were the only two situations over time, if you looked at the case law, where the court had found a constitutional violation. And I think the Chief Justice's point was, this is the interpretation of the Constitution that has developed over time. Um, there's no reason for the court to, to add an entirely new category, this, this uh, infinitely broader possibility of bias category. And so I think the Chief Justice's decision, um, more than the majority, was grounded in the precedent as exists today. And that, of course, gets back into the question of the role of the judges that Professor Marcus um, mentioned at the outset. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention is just to, to reiterate what Justice Bale said, which I think the, um, the, the biggest question in this case is whether this is just sort of a one-off situation dealing with a situation that is so extraordinary that it actually was the basis of a John Grisham novel. Um, and that's true. Um, or is this really going to sort of result in the open the Pandora's box to these sorts of motions? And you know, if if giving money to a judge um, is unconstitutional, if the judge doesn't recuse himself, well, then how about friendships? Um, how about um, political affiliation? You know, the presidents appoint the justices. Should the just, justices recuse themselves when? when cases in that administration come up. I mean, there, there really are any number of other situations. If possibility of bias is really the standard, um, then judges um, really would have to, um, I think, to fairly apply that standard, would have to recuse themselves in, in a large number of cases where that just hasn't been the case. I think that Justice Bale's uh, description of what's going on here is a choice between a rule or a standard is, is really an interesting observation. and. It, this just is just a reflection. I don't know constitutional laws as well as I should, and I don't pay attention to the court as much as I should. Um, uh, but I have noticed this last year when I did this and then this year also in reading Justice Kennedy's opinions that there seems to be a jurisprudence of standards that he's developing. Maybe that goes back longer than just these last couple of years, but uh, an example would be the Buma Dien case where he articulated a standard uh, uh, um, to determine when, out of, when extra, when, when 
people detained abroad by American forces have a right to petition the federal courts for habeas corpus. Uh, he was unable to offer a rule there. He offered a standard. Uh, we see in Iqbal and in this case standards as well. And that leads the question to what I mean, leads me to the question is what, is what is Justice Kennedy up to? Is this more purposeful? Is this just some sort of jurisprudential um, uh, uh, preference of his? Or is he reflecting on this historical moment and how utterly out of control elections have gotten in some states? Uh, it is, in, the Abraham case is extreme, but uh, it's not, uh, not unique. State Farm Insurance Company, for example, funded a judicial elect, uh, a can candidate or advocated on behalf of a candidate in Illinois uh, to the tune of something like, I don't even know, more than this some, in the numbers of millions of dollars. Uh, and that person was elected to the Illinois Supreme Court uh, at, at a very important time for State Farm when it was facing a huge class action judgment that it was trying to get overturned uh, on appeal. And it, it succeeded in doing so by a single vote before the Illinois Supreme Court. And I wonder if Justice Kennedy is using a standard to try to incentivize. And the reason why he uses the due process clause, creates an ambiguous, somewhat vague standard, is to try to incentivize states to take precisely the steps that Justice Bales um, um, uh, outlined uh, more precise, uh, specific recusal rules than may already be in place. Um, I think that that's why I'm not particularly convinced or I find particularly compelling Justice, Chief Justice Roberts' citation to the, to the precedent that just General Garr described. It's absolutely correct that this, the Supreme Court has limited recusal under the Due Process Clause to two very precise scenarios. I think that the, the historical moment is particularly important here. That's why I, I started with the history that I did. The idea for quite a long time was that judicial elections were a way to guarantee judicial independence. It's only since the turn of the century, this century really, that, judicial, that expenditures on judicial elections have turned judicial elections into normal elections. And I think a lot of people fear that fate, that we don't want judicial elections to be normal elections, that we want them to be something different. And uh, if that's what Kennedy's up to, then a standard that incentivizes states to try to take some action um, ex ante to protect against the onslaught of, uh, of very hard to decide um, Caperton motions, why that, that maybe this might be an effective uh, tactic of his. But that's all speculation on my part. I, I certainly couldn't purport to know what's going on inside his head. One, one further thought prompted by what Professor Marcus just said. Part of the background to what's been occurring with judicial elections is actually another case by the Supreme Court decided several years ago called Republican Party of Minnesota versus White. And it was a case in which uh, in, a, in a contested election, a candidate for a judgeship wanted to announce their views on issues that would likely come before the court. And Minnesota at that time had a, a canon of judicial conduct that said you can't do that. Um, judges are different. They're not like just any other political candidate. And it got to the Supreme Court. And, and the Supreme Court, in a, I believe it was a 5-4 opinion, said that if states choose to have judicial elections, uh, they can't, consistent with the First Amendment, prevent candidates from announcing their views this way. And, and many people read that opinion as saying that in judicial elections, the First Amendment rights of judicial candidates were essentially the same as the rights that a candidate for the legislature would have or a candidate for elected executive office. And it, it has led to around the country challenges to various rules that tried to sort of channel how judicial campaigns would be conducted. In some, in some uh, courts uh, have struck down things like limits on judges soliciting campaign contributions or appearing at uh, partisan party events and that kind of thing. Um, some would say that perhaps one thing that Caperton suggests is the court has begun now to recognize that you shouldn't equate judicial elections with elections for other office. And, and in particular, and this is a point that a, a professor at UCLA named Rick Hasen, who does election law, has noted. Generally, with regard to campaign finance law, the Supreme Court has said the danger lies in contributions. Contributions pose threats of either corruption on the part of the candidates or the appearance of corruption. On the other hand, expenditures independent of contributions, the court has viewed more benignly. Well, in the Caperton case, what we're talking about are expenditures that were made independent of the candidate. Yet the court there found that independent expenditures, at least in a judicial election, could raise a constitutionally objectionable risk of actual bias. So there, there seems to be the implication that judicial elections may in some sense be different. The case also might be significant for its recognition that 
while candidates for judicial office may have First Amendment interests in the process of elections, there is another constitutional interest at stake, and that is the due process interest in ensuring a fair tribunal once the election is over. And, and perhaps recognizing that there are multiple constitutional interests at stake will give rise down the road to, to more leeway in terms of state regulation of the nature of judicial elections. Well, I mean, I guess I would just add that I absolutely agree with the justice and the professor. I guess that sounds a little bit like Gilgan's Island or something like that. But, uh, <laughs> um, um, that, that this decision is very much a product of its time uh, and a product with a growing unrest, particularly among the justices, um, with the state of judicial elections in this country. I mean, I guess the only thing I would leave it. Um, the, the audience with is a question as to whether or not, you know, the, the interpretation of the Constitution um, ought to depend on, um, you know, a given historical moment like that or whether it's something that um, should be viewed as more finite. And I think the dissenters in this case viewed it as something that was more finite and that even if they thought there was a problem, it wasn't, the solution wasn't necessarily for the Supreme Court um, to come up with a new interpretation of the Due Process Clause. you have any questions for the panel? Yes. So as a life superintendent, and if I'm a uh, Lincoln chip, why would I look at this decision as necessarily an impediment to discipline, but rather like a guide to discipline? And I say, okay, well, the next election, I'll just get three million dollars from McGraw, and he'll have to recuse himself, and I'll have the decision that I would like. <laughs> the question is why this decision wouldn't allow lawyers to still manipulate who they have on the court to hear their case by giving m large donations or making large expenditures on behalf of candidates that they want to get off their case. Right, I, mean, I, I think that's a, it's a great question. And, and just, just to be clear, I mean, you don't even have to give it to the judge. You just have to spend it. Um, you just have to go out in the airwaves and say, you know, I want this guy off the court and benefits other person. More questions, yes. The question is whether the panelists would comment on the case the court just heard last week involving Hillary the movie and um, whether they're going to go further in their campaign um, finance jurisprudence and strike down the, what little regulation there is. Mr. Garr or uh, Justice Bales? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean the, the, the case involves a challenge to the electioneering communications provision of the uh, McCain-Feingold legislation which basically um, prohibits pe people for speaking, from speaking out, corporations from speaking out about candidates within certain windows around elections in a way that's designed to be express advocacy, real support of a candidate, not an issue ad. Um, and the court had upheld the constitutionality of that provision in the case that I worked on um, in 2004, I think, um, in the McCain-Feingold case, and the court is reconsidering that decision along with one of its earlier precedents, a, a case called Austin, the Austin case, which um, upheld uh, a state law which imposed similar limits on a corporation. Um, and I think if you read the transcript in that argument, uh, I think um, uh, it's, it's reasonable to speculate that those decisions um, are in jeopardy. I mean, the fact that the court took the unusual step of re-arguing a case, this was a case that was argued last term, and at the end of in June, on its very last day, the case said, we're going to re-argue this case and we want the parties to address whether we should overrule these decisions. Now, if you're someone who wants those decisions to continue, that was not a welcome development. Um, and, but, and I think if you read the transcript, it, it seemed as though there were five justices who were very much skeptical um, of the logic of those decisions. Um, the only other thing I would say is it's important to recognize um, that this case dealt with expenditures, not contributions. Some of the media um, coverage of this case has blurred the two, and so it's true that for nearly 100 years, Congress has regulated um, the authority of corporations to contribute to candidates. Um, and the rationale for that is you have this, a sense of quid pro quo corruption. If you give money to someone, they will do things to help you. And the Congress has, has said you, for corporations, you can't do that, and the court has upheld that. 
This case doesn't um, directly address that situation, and I would be surprised if the court did in resolving it. Instead, it de deals with a separate situation of where corporations are making expenditures um, about uh, candidates in the election. So they're not giving money directly to that candidate, but instead just spending their own money to speak out on behalf of the candidate. And the court has always uh, said that the First Amendment has much broader protection for expenditures as opposed to contributions. I, I guess one thing, if you wanted to sort of think, think through possible scenarios, if the court did strike down both Austin and the consequence would also be to strike down that one part of uh, the McCain-Feingold Act that had been upheld in McConnell. If they did that and the implication were that corporations and unions can use treasury funds to engage in express advocacy for or against candidates, and, and that's what's been disallowed since Austin at least. If corporations could do that, what would the consequences be in those states that have contested judicial elections? In Washington, for instance, if, if Microsoft could spend as much as it wanted to out of its treasury, it probably could elect the Supreme Court. Um, and I, that's, a, that's a very troubling prospect to me. Um, I'm not a fan of elected judges <laughs> or of, of the system of using elections to pick judges. Uh, if, if that's how things unfold on First Amendment grounds, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe people would then revisit more carefully the process for selecting judges. Um, wholly apart from whatever, whatever you think about the merits of that kind of system for picking other elected officials. But one other thing that's really interesting about that argument is that during the argument, an even broader proposition was raised in, in question by Justice Sotomayor and Justice Ginsburg in particular, um, which is whether or not corporations really ought to enjoy constitutional rights at all. Um, and, and you know, we, the, the case sort of gets there on the premise that these corporations have First Amendment rights to speak. Um, and, and you know, it really would be an interesting and, and really fundamental change if the court were going to go in that direction of reconsidering that. Coincidentally, that's a, that's a point that Justice Rehnquist raised in a case called First National Bank versus Bilotti. Um, where the majority said, hey, it, First Amendment, it's the speech. It's not the speaker that matters. But, but Justice Rehnquist's point of dissent was, these are corporations. The states can decide what privileges they have. So. There's one more over here. No? Any other questions? Okay, now's a good time for a break then. We'll break for about 10 minutes. I think there might be water outside the doors. I think we're ready to get started again, and now we're going to start with a case that actually came out of Arizona. Professor Marcus? In December of 2001, I closed my criminal procedure casebook, walked out of my criminal procedure classroom, and I have very, very thankfully never encountered criminal procedure again until today. Um, that's my own personal uh, feeling uh, on the matter, but I just, so I say that by way of excusing my own uh, ignorance uh, um, uh, about this case. Uh, Arizona versus Gantt presents in particularly stark colors how weak a hold prior case law can have on the Supreme Court and how willing justices are to make new law to serve policy ends. The original meaning of the Constitution and, frankly, precedent factored little into the court's decision in the Gantt case, uh, a decision that involves a fundamental reworking of a small but important corner of criminal procedure. And to say, just to make the larger point, in, in reading up on this case, I discovered that uh, the search incident to arrest exception to the Fourth Amendment warrant requirement is, uh, is, a, is one that has been completely changed, has changed, seems to change every decade or so. Uh, precedent in this area seems to have particularly little hold on the justices. This case involved, can, involves the conditions under which the police can search inside an arrestee's car without a warrant as a search incident to an arrest. The central premise of the 14th and Fourth Amendment, as you all know, is that the police must, whenever practicable, obtain a warrant, a, a pro, advanced judicial approval of searches and seizures through a warrant application process. However, as many of you know, there is the exception to this warrant requirement, uh, the search incident to arrest exception. To understand Arizona versus Gantt, I think we have to go back to 1969 in a case called Schimmel versus California. The court in Schimmel held that a search is an incident to arrest is okay when it's in furtherance of one of two t uh, twin rationales. First, to look for weapons to ensure officer safety, that the police officer can do a search incident to arrest to, to try to find a weapon that the arrestee might use to either injure him or her or try to escape. And secondly, to search for evidence to protect against its destruction, the fear being that an arrestee 
could, uh, after an arrest but before booking, could uh, dispose of evidence. Thus, the search could only be of the arrestee's person and the area within the immediate control of the arrestee, the grab area, uh, where the, the arrestee might gain possession of either a weapon or evidence. And so holding the court flatly jettisoned previous precedent that had allowed officers much more leeway in deciding when to conduct a search incident to an arrest. Schimmel, in my mind, makes ample sense. We don't want an arrestee's Fourth Amendment rights to, to mean that police officers get stabbed or shot. But at the same time, we don't want the Fourth Amendment to disappear upon an arrest. We justify the exception based on a good policy rationale. But the court quite soon began to move away from the real-world logic behind the exception uh, to a formalistic approach that really had little to do with Schimmel's twin policy rationales. In 1973, in a case called United States versus Robinson, the court held that the police could search an arrestee even though the person was arrested for operating a motor vehicle without a license as a search incident to an arrest. Now, a person operating a motor vehicle without a license is not usually the type of person we would think who would pull a gun on a police officer to try to escape. Nor would we think that the person could successfully destroy evidence of the crime, like being arrested for uh, driving without a license. The court's rationale in the case is that police need a bright line rule. We don't want police officers having, being in the position of having to assess on a case by case basis whether this person might be armed or this person might try to destroy evidence. Uh, rather, the, it's always okay to search an arrestee's person and grab area without a warrant as an incident to an arrest, even if the pro policy rationales for the exception no longer obtain. Things got even more formalistic in, in the New York versus, versus Belton case, a 1981 case a, a, involving a search of an automobile incident to an arrest. The police, uh, police officer pulled over a car that was speeding on the New York Thruway. The police officer smelled marijuana, looked inside the car window, and saw an envelope marked Super Gold, which the police officer recognizes as a, a brand, a type of marijuana. Uh, which leads me to the question is, why is marijuana always called things like super gold? Uh, it just sounds like something out of a Judd Apatow movie. Um, why, why don't these people think of better names for their products so that it doesn't appeal so obviously to the male 18 to 32 year old demographic? Um, the, the police arrested the four occupants of the car, split the occupants up into different areas on the New York Thruway, then searched the car and found in the jacket of one of the, of the defendant's, uh, ja uh, the pocket of the, ja ja the defendant's jacket, cocaine. The court determined to, ar determined to articulate a bright line rule, as it did in Robinson for the, for the search of, of a car incident to an arrest, held that the police can search the entire passenger compartment of a car, as well as any containers within this, this compartment, as being within the immediate control of the arrestee, so long as the search was contemporaneous with the arrest. It doesn't matter if the defendant is already outside of the car and detained somewhere else. Now, how does Belton stack up against Schimmel's twin rationales? Not particularly well in my mind, unless the arrestee had 10-foot long arms and could reach from his stationary position on the New York Thruway into the car and grab the super gold. The final stop before Arizona versus Gantt is the United States versus Thornton, where the search incident to the arrest requirement for automobiles com goes completely off the rails, to mix metaphors slightly. Any suggestion that Schimmel's twin rationales should limit when the search incident arrest is OK uh, falls to the wayside. The police officer observed the defendant driving a car in a suspicious manner uh, and ran a license check and, and discovered the license plates didn't match the, the car. Uh, before the police officer could pull the defendant over, the defendant parked the car and started walking through a parking lot. The police officer went up to the defendant on foot, started asking questions, and then arrested him and, and patted him down and found, uh, found drugs on the defendant's person. The police officer handcuffed the defendant, put him in a secure patrol car, and then searched the defendant's car, discovering a 9 millimeter. Okay, so here, unless the defendant had 10-foot arms, could break through steel, force his way out of a patrol car, and grab that, those, uh, that 9 millimeter before the police officer could, could, could uh, secure him, uh, there's no way that the guy was going to get the gun to attack the police officer. If the search incident to arrest were limited by Schimmel's twin rationales, this is an easy case. But the court nonetheless held the search was okay. The rationale, as I understand it, is that the defendant here had no more access to the car than the defendant did in the Belton case. Uh, we need a clear rule. We don't want police officers having to make the calculation as to when they can conduct the search on a case-by-case -case basis. So here we are, at least before Arizona versus Gantt this term. If you are arrested while in a car, the police can search your car, period. It doesn't matter what you're arrested for. It doesn't matter where you were when the search is underway. And why is this? Because we want to give the police a clear rule so they don't have to exercise judgment on a case-by-case -case basis. The Arizona v. Gantt case, the facts are fairly simple. Oh my gosh, two minutes. Is that right? Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> the, scene is a, the scene is a house close to, I'm going to exceed my two minutes for a couple if you don't mind. The scene is a house close to Alvernon and Grant here in Tucson. 
Uh, the police have a tip that Gant's house is being used for drug trafficking. They show up. Gant has an outstanding warrant for driving, a, uh, driving a, a vehicle with a suspended license. Police show up. They talk to him for a bit. They, they, they leave. They come back later, and they find two individuals engaged in drug-related activities, arrest them. Gant then drives up. He gets out of his car, walks to the police officer 10 to 15 feet away. They start talking. He gets arrested for the crime of driving with a suspended license. Um, uh, the police then search his car after securing him in a patrol car. The police search his car and discover cocaine. The Arizona Supreme Court, ultimately, after a number of procedural ups and downs, the Arizona Supreme Court ultimately concluded that drugs had to be suppressed. Now, Justice Bales wrote a dissent, and he evoked the somewhat obscure and hard to find, hard to understand rule that lower courts may often be bound by Supreme Court decisions. Uh, I, I congratulate Justice Bales and his clerk for uncovering this very minute part of American jurisprudence. Justice Bales in his dissent also, however, intimates, and I'll say intimate because I'll let Justice Bales uh, tell you uh, what he wrote, he intimates that the Robinson, Belton, Thornton line of cases have gotten a little out of control and perhaps the Supremes should revisit these decisions. Uh, the oral argument in this case produced some really fun questions. Uh, so Justice Scalia, of course, is very interested in the original meaning of the, of the Fourth Amendment, so he asked this question of the attorneys. If you stopped Thomas Jefferson's carriage to arrest Thomas Jefferson and you pulled him off to the side of the road, could you then go and search his carriage? Uh, Jefferson, as we all know, was really into super gold, so this probably came up all the time back in the 1790s. But nobody actually knew the answer to this question. The court in a 5-4 decision with Scalia, a somewhat surprising different lineup, Scalia joining Stevens, Ginsburg, Souter, and Thomas, agrees with both sides of the Arizona Supreme Court. The, the majority agrees with the majority of the Arizona Supreme Court that drugs must be suppressed. But they, the court essentially agrees with Justice Bales that in order to suppress the drugs, the court has to get rid of its Belton and Thornton line of cases and re return the search incident to arrest requirement to its shimmel roots, exception, excuse me, to its shimmel roots. Uh, under Arizona versus Gantt, the police can only search the interior of a car as an incident to arrest, number one, when the officer's safety rationale uh, justifies it, number two, when the evidence, the, the destruction of evidence rationale justifies it, or drawing upon Justice Scalia's concurrence in the Thornton case, when uh, the police are looking for evidence of the crime for which they're arresting the uh, arrestee. The dissenters, Justice Alito writing for Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, Kennedy, Justices Breyer and Kennedy, say, wait a minute, what about precedent? What about stare decisis? Doesn't this stuff matter anymore? What's going on? The majority doesn't even go through the type of rigorous analysis prescribed in opinions like Planned Parenthood or Lawrence versus Texas um, as an outline for when precedent can be overruled or, or, or ignored. And what about bright line rules? How will police officers possibly know what to do in individual circumstances? This case is not so much about fear of judging, as I uh, suggested at the outset of these remarks. There is a fear of judging the dissent, but it's not so much the fear of judging by judges, but a fear of judging by police officers. That without the blanket authorization to conduct the searches of incident to arrest of automobiles, they won't know what to do in individual cases. Uh, what this case certainly does, I think, is lay bare the obvious wisdom in Justice Sotomayor's claim that appellate judges are policymakers. With an area of reference to the original meaning of the Fourth Amendment, with little respect paid to precedent, the majority refashions constitutional law in this important corner of criminal procedure, and in my mind, in a, in a sensible and intelligent way, uh, in order to bring, uh, in, bring the search incident arrest uh, uh, exception in line with its basic policy uh, roots. Well, one thing that I think is really interesting about the case that I don't think any of the opinions expressly recognize is, you know, it illustrates the evolution of Fourth Amendment doctrine uh, in, in, in this sense. The, the court, if you go back to Schimmel and Robinson, the court is making some generalizations about what happens upon a custodial arrest. Well, Schimmel, they say, concerns for officer safety or preservation of evidence supports a warrantless search of the arrestee. Robinson then says, well, we're not going to require you to make a case-specific showing of those exigencies. While in general, they support a warrantless search, uh, police officers need clear rules, and, and the fact of the arrest itself is sufficient to justify the search of the suspect's person. Belton takes that a step further and says, well, you know, we've said that in addition to allowing the search of the person and the area within their reach, uh, we're going to, in the context of automobiles, assume that the entire interior of the automobile and everything that's in it are, in effect, within the reach of the arrestee, and we're going to allow the search of that area, too, so long as it's incident to the arrest. So you, you have the court 
expanding exceptions to the Fourth Amendment based on some assumptions about how the world works, assumptions about the danger that's inherent in custodial arrests in different situations. Well, not surprisingly, once the court enunciates its standard in Belton, police practices respond. They're not static. I mean, these react to each other. And as a result of Belton, across the country, police officers are taught that if you arrest someone in a car, the first thing you do if you can is you put them in handcuffs in your patrol car, and then you go back and search their car because everyone understood Belton as allowing that kind of search. So what has happened is police practices have evolved in response to the court's First Amendment doctrine in a way that erodes the rationale for the exception to the warrant requirement that the court had adopted. And I, and I think if the court had just grasped that directly, um, for me at least, it would have been a more satisfying opinion. Now the opinion that emerges in Gantt is itself puzzling and it's itself um, in some respects inconsistent with its very rationale. I think I differ with, just, or with Professor Marcus a little bit on what, what Justice Stevens holds for the majority. What he says is um, that a Belton type search can only occur if the suspect is unsecured and within reach of the auto. But he seems to then allow, consistent with Belton, an open-ended search of the car's interior and any containers found therein. And that's why Justice Scalia and his concurrence says, you know, I don't really like what the majority's done. It, it is going to encourage game playing on the part of the police. And I'd, I'd be in favor, Justice Scalia says, of just overruling the, the line of uh, Belton Thornton completely. But I don't want the court to be split 4-1-4. So I'm willing to go along so, so long as the court says, in addition to this sort of modified Belton, you also can search incident to the rest if you have reason to believe the car has evidence related to the offense that supports the arrest. Now, two things. If you really agree with Justice Stevens in his approach that Chamel should drive the existence of the exception, you have to ask yourself, well, why then would you even permit a warrantless search when the suspect is standing there with his hand on the hood Unless, in that case, there's some reason to think there's either a danger to officer safety or to the preservation of evidence. So it, the majority opinion, I think, is a little inconsistent in that way. Similarly, Justice Scalia's version isn't justified at all in anything tied to the Chanel exigencies. I mean, Justice Scalia just says you ought to be able to, if you arrest somebody, you ought to be able to search the car if you have reason to believe that the offense for which you arrested them, that there's going to be evidence associated with that in the car. You know, what's the basis for that? And we, the other thing I think that bears noting is as a practical matter, I don't think Gantt, while well, Gantt's going to change police practices in terms of how they conduct searches incident to the arrest of occupants of cars, I don't think it's going to change very much how often cars get searched because we, we have an automobile exception. If the police have probable cause to think a car has contraband or other evidence in it, they get to search it for that reason alone, whether or not they arrest anybody who's around it. They also, if they have reason to believe an occupant, whether or not they're the driver, may pose a danger to the police, they can conduct a protective search of the compartment of the vehicle. And if they do arrest the person and they're any place on a public road, they can take the car back to the station and do an inventory search. So there are all these other exceptions that are already out there. And I guess another thing that, that I find a little dissatisfying with the way the opinion is written is in, in assessing what the rule should be, they don't explicitly address that fact either. Um, you know, all of that said, I am, I'm glad the court did revisit Belton. Um, I was hoping they'd come up with a rule that was a little clearer and more internally coherent. But. Um, well, I, I think this is one of the most interesting cases of the term, and it's actually something that hasn't received much attention, so I'm glad we're talking about it here. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, the first thing is to look at the lineup in this case, and it's so unusual. And, I, and I'm not sure if it uh, proves uh, Justice Marcus's uh, Professor Marcus's theory that... I'll accept the uh, <laughs> promotion. <laughs> I'll, if you just granted me tenure, that'd be fine for me for today. 
I promise not to call you Professor Justice. Um, uh, if you accept his theory, I don't think it proves his theory that judges are just making it up as, it, as they go along. Um, but, but it does uh, indicate that you can't always predict what the Supreme Court's going to do. And that's one of the reasons why I love this case, is there's a sense in which people always think that there's this conservative block and liberal block, um, and that's how cases come down 5-4. And that was largely true in the other two cases we decided. But it, I think it bears going back to look at the majority, the majority and dissenting blocks in this case. Majority, you've got a decision written by Justice Stevens, joined by Justice Souter and Justice Ginsburg. So you're like, okay, this is good. They're, you know, they're falling into line. They're, these justices are, are for more Fourth Amendment protection. But then to, to round out the majority, you have Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas. And wow, that's a bizarre collection, let me tell you that. Um, and then the dissent, you've got Justice Thomas joined by the chief and Justice Kennedy. So you're thinking, okay, these are the people who are sort of pro-police. And then you've got Justice Breyer. So it's just it's a fascinating lineup. Um, I mean, ultimately, I think what this case boiled down to is, is differing views on the court on the uh, role of stare decisis, um, the sort of venerable doctrine that we all know about that courts generally give respect to their decisions unless there are particular reasons to overrule them. And there's a great debate among the court. And I think Justice Breyer's opinion is really interesting in this respect. And he, I think, was the most candid of the justices when he said that, look, you know, I've looked at Belton. I don't I think this makes a whole lot of sense. If I was on the Belton court, I probably would have come out differently. But Belton is Belton. It's been around for 28 years. It provides a clear rule. And I don't think they've come up with any reason um, for us to, to revisit that today or, or, or to come up with a different rule. Um, but the, uh, the majority disagreed with that. And then in thinking about stare decisis, one of, the, one of the factors that the court usually looks to is societal expectations. And there was a case a few years back called Dickerson versus United States, which dealt with the question of whether the court should overrule Miranda. Uh, and, and in a um, significant decision written by the former Chief Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist, 7-2, Chief Justice Rehnquist, who we all know was no fan of Miranda to begin with, nevertheless wrote this grand decision about how we should retain Miranda because Miranda has become part of our national fabric. After all, there's lots of uh, TV shows about cops who read Miranda rights. And, that's what, and so that we all know about Miranda. Well, how, you know, how would it be if the Supreme Court just got rid of it? Um, well, in this case, what you have is a 28-year-old decision that it provided a rule of really great importance to the officer of the field. What do you do in the commonly recurring situation where you um, stop a vehicle and you arrest the occupant? When can you search the car? And the Supreme Court said, anytime you, you uh, arrest a recent occupant of a car, you can search the vehicle. There's the rule. Um, it's been taught in police academies since. And, and really, among the rules of, civil, of criminal procedure, it's one of the more well-established rules that's developed. And lo and behold, the Supreme Court comes along 28 years later um, and just sort of dismantles it because um, it, it, the current justices um, want to go back and revisit the um, rationale in that case. And I guess the last thing I would say on stare decisis is I think if you're going to effectively gut a Supreme Court decision, you at least ought to give it a proper burial. And, and what's remarkable about, remarkable about the majority decision in this case is they didn't um, come out and, and say what we all know really happened here, which is the court has overruled Belton and Thornton. Um, two other points, and then I'll stop. Um, the next is I think the, the opinion really shows um, an unusual um, disregard for the, for, the, for the interests of police and, and the, the, the situation that police face in the field. I think in a lot of situations, the Supreme Court and the justices are particularly conscious to what's going on. They want to know the practical consequences of their acts. Um, I actually argued the Thornton case that Professor Marcus talked about a few years ago, which was um, Belton's last day. Um, and you know, one of the things that I did getting ready for the argument was to go to talk to police officers around the country in training academies and in the field and ask them, um, get a sense of what it's like to arrest um, uh, a, the occupant of a vehicle, to pull over a car and, and, and uh, conduct that arrest. And I will tell you, every single one of them told me that it is one of the most dangerous situations that police officers face. When you think of the lone policeman pulling, the, pulling over the car in the middle of the highway. Um, he doesn't know what's in the car. There's a reason why he's pulled it over. Um, and and uh, they want to search, they want to handcuff the individual before they go back and look in the car to see if there's a gun or contraband or anything else. And they're thinking about their own safety there. And believe it or not, every year, I know this because I exhaustively <laughs> researched it, every year there are at least a handful of cases where suspects who are handcuffed somehow miraculously get free and harm police officers. It does happen, and I just think that this is a situation where there's not even a serious discussion in the court's decision about the plight of the police officer 
here. And then really what you get is a sense of deja vu all over again because if you go back and read the Belton decision, um, the court handed down the bright line rule in Belton precisely because there was this great uncertainty um, about how Schimmel would apply to the policeman in the field. When, when was the, the recent occupant of the car um, within reach of the vehicle? When was it okay to search it? You know, courts were all over the places. Policemen had no idea um, when they could handcuff the person, when they could go and search the car, and it was a really dangerous situation for police. And so the court said, we've got to come up with this bright line rule. It resolved it, and now here we are back to square one. And the last thing I'll say is I don't, I don't really think that at the end of the day, this is a great victory for the Fourth Amendment. I mean, first of all, the, one of the, the solutions that they come up with, as Justice um, Bales mentioned, is that police can search a car anytime they have reasonable re reason to believe that there's contraband in the car. Really? I mean, where does that test come from? I mean, the Fourth Amendment, probable cause, a warrant, reason to believe? I mean, that's not exactly a very pro-Fourth Amendment standard. And secondly, police, if they want to, can just impound the vehicle. They can pull it out. They, they can arrest him. They can impound the vehicle. They can take it back to the station, and they can search it uh, with a fine-tooth comb. But the one thing that the police officer can't do after Belton is the very thing that they've been taught to do for 30 years, which is do the safe thing, handcuff the guy, and then go search the car. Um, uh, just a couple of things. I, I, I wonder if the pre-Arizona versus Gantt regime gave police quite the bright line rule that, uh, that the dissenters in this opinion suggested. And, and Justice Bales can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think this case went up and down once before it came, before the, er, this, this iteration, on the question of whether uh, Gantt was a recent occupant of the car, and thus whether the search was contemporaneous with the arrest. Uh, that's the requirement under Robinson. Uh, maybe or that's a requirement pre pre uh, pre Arizona v. Gantt that the arrest, that the search be conducted contemporaneous with the arrest, and that that leaves quite a considerable amount of uncertainty. When is a search contemporaneous with a, an arrest? When is an arrestee a recent occupant of the car such that the search can proceed? I, I don't think that that's necessarily left. I don't know to what extent that, that gave police officers the, the sort of bright line guidance that, that, that perhaps uh, the dissenters in this case suggested that it did. As for the practices of the police, I can't speak to any personal uh, research that I've, I've done on this, um, but I did read a study about, the, 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 about training that police receive in California, uh, and pre, pre, I think it was pre-Thornton, uh, the, the uniform training was don't mess around. When you arrest someone, arrest them. Don't lean into a car and search it while the defendant's still in the, the arrestee's still in the car. That's a very dangerous situation. Arrest the guy, put him in handcuffs, and then you can proceed. And and if, if that's indeed the case, I'll, putting aside the, the number of the instances where a def, where an arrestee has escaped from handcuffs and, and then grabbed a, a weapon and, and, and uh, injured the police officer, if generally speaking, the general practice of police officers is first to arrest the arrestee, then it seems to me a regime that would then allow the police officer to search freely based purely on that arrest and nothing more doesn't really make any sense. If the general practice of police officers is to first in, uh, incapacitate the arrestee. And so I, this goes to the police practice, the actual police practice question. Justice Rehnquist and Chief Justice Rehnquist in the Thornton opinion, I believe, if I'm, I may be mistaken, but I believe he, he explained the, the continued divergence from the policy rationales for in the Schimmel case as, well, we don't want police to have to choose between arresting a defendant and then searching a car or and, and give up the strategic benefit of the searches into the arrest. We don't have to the police don't want, we don't have to, the police have to choose between that tactic and that or leaving the defendant in the car and then gaining the benefit of having the defendant in the car and there, therefore being able to uh, search the car. Um, and that, that seems completely unfounded. That doesn't seem to reflect police practice at all uh, based on what I read. And so it, I guess this is just by way of building on the themes that uh, General Gar and Justice Bales mentioned, um, but I'm not, I don't see how the regime before uh, Arizona versus Gantt was added anything to officer safety or, or the like. So um, but I, I don't purport, again, to have the personal experience necessary to make this determination. I do want to say that I think police officers know a lot more criminal procedure than someone like me who doesn't know much about police officers uh, think they do. Certainly more criminal procedure than I know. Uh, having, I sat in on some trainings of some police officers when they were, learned about the Fourth Amendment and I was sort of 
blown away by how much more sophisticated an understanding of the, the very intricate case law under the Fourth Amendment, uh, how sophisticated this, the, the instruction was. And, and so I, I'm a little bit more uh, willing, after that experience, willing to believe that maybe they have the body of knowledge necessary to make case-by-case -case determinations and, and that the court in this case maybe credited them for their ability to do so. Do we have any questions from the audience? None. Question is whether Robinson is still good law. Mr. Garr, are you going to take that one? Or well, I mean, I guess I think it's a, it's a valid question. I mean, I think this decision sort of calls into question um, the rationale of Schimmel and everything and everything that's going on here. I mean, if you're really going to sort of look behind Belton, then why don't you look behind these other um, decisions in this line as well? Justice Fields? Yeah, I think where, where you'll first see some um, tension in the case law isn't going to be with searches of the arrestee's person, but it's going to involve searches of uh, things like a backpack a suspect might have within their reach at the time of the arrest, but which is then removed from them. Because if you think about it, why should the search of that backpack be treated differently than the search of an automobile once the suspect is secured and unable to reach the backpack? Now, most courts have relied on Robinson to say in those circumstances, if the person had the article within reach at the time of their arrest, it can be searched without any case-specific showing of either uh, officer safety concerns or preservation of evidence concerns. And, and that holding is obviously now in tension with the rationale the court adopted in um, Gantt. Other questions? Question is, can the court's decision in Herring, did you say Herring, can be um, harmonized with the decision in Gantt? You know, I, I, I think they're difficult to harmonize because they involve different areas. I mean, the Herring case was a 5 4 decision um, extending the exclusionary rule to a, a limited new factual context where there's a mistake in record keeping in a police department as opposed to a mistake in record keeping uh, in a court. Um, which it, where the court had previously um, held that the exclusionary rule doesn't apply. And there are now five justices who seem to be um, willing, at least on an incremental basis, to scale back the exclusionary rule. Now, Gantt involves a situation where there's been a little bit of a, I think, of a fad among the Supreme Court justices to, to question Belton. I mean, Justice Scalia um, sort of started it in the Thornton case, um, and the court um, uh, was able to duck the issue in that case. Thornton actually involved the question that uh, Professor Marcus alluded to, which is um, how does Belton apply when the person gets out of the car before the police officer arrests him? Is that person a recent occupant? And the court said, yes, that's per that person is a recent occupant. Um, but to get back to your question, I don't think you can really reconcile it. I just think that the Fourth Amendment, the, the court, you know, Fourth Amendment is one of the areas where the court is most interesting to follow. The justices really get into it. Um, they, they, you know, get into the different hypotheticals and the factual situations, situations, and I, and I think they're more willing to just kind of um, rethink first principles than in, than in other areas. And uh, so the, the exclusionary rule that the, the, the five justices that resulted in the majority here just seem to be um, willing to go in that direction. Uh, what, we, the United States filed an amicus brief uh, on behalf of the, the state in this case. No, I think that's a fair point. I mean, in this case, um, the guy drove up to a, a crack house 
um, and there were already police officers there. Um, you know, I think they were probably get, he gets out of the car, he's immediately met. So, you know, to be fair, there's, there's little risk to the police, and, and, and there are certainly multiple situations where there are many police officers involved. Um, but of course, um, I think there are many situations where the police officer is alone with the suspect, and that's, that's the situation uh, that police officers are most concerned with, and, and there's nothing in this decision that limits it to the, situ to the case where there's the, the police officer alone. Now, the Belton case did involve that situation. You stop a car along the roadside, and uh, there, there are multiple occupants. There's one police officer. He asked him to step out of the car. Um, and you know, now after this decision, you can't handcuff them. You've got to, you really do have this, what the, the center's called, this perverse incentive. If, if you want to search the car, you have to sort of put your own safety more at risk. And, and you know, I think in, there's a sense in, in the decision in Gantt that what police really want to do is just search because they're police and they want to search. Um, but really, if you talk to the police, at least in my experience, I mean, they're really more concerned about their safety. I guess we can go on to the next case. This last case of the day is uh, rated PG-13 for uh, improper language. Um, so I, I advise you that at the outset, I don't uh, enjoy particularly using uh, bad words, but I will today, this afternoon. Uh, this case, F FCC versus Fox, addresses whether the FCC can sanction a broadcaster for so-called fleeting expletives used on one of the broadcaster's shows. Uh, but before that, a little history. Modern administrative law, like mod the modern administrative state more generally, uh, is a product of the New Deal. The Administrative Procedure Act, which is the main pillar of modern administrative law, uh, was enacted in 1946, arguably at the very tail end of the, of the New Deal. The APA allows courts to strike down agency action when the action is arbitrary and capricious. In other words, when a reasonable agency action or agency action that has based on some rational explanation is beyond the power of the court to review. This circumscribed power of judges to review agency action is essentially a compromise between two competing visions of the administrative state that were set forth in the 1930s. The first edition was that of the New Dealers. Uh, these guys believed in expert agencies. They thought expert agencies, working apart from the political process, were the key to good, sophisticated government. New Dealers had this great belief in data, this great belief in scientific expertise and aptitude. If, if, they could, if we could only get politics out of government, uh, politics out of economic and social policy, give experts the power to make decisions, they'll get it right. To New Dealers, judicial review of agency action was an anathema. Judges were experts, not generalists. They were not suited to reviewing the kind of data necessary to make informed judgments as to what economic and social needs were. Moreover, to New Dealers, judges had this horrible uh, track record of striking down social welfare legislation in the years leading up to the Great Depression. They had meddled in affair affairs they had no business meddling in, uh, leading to bad results for everybody. The alternative vision was the conservative uh, uh, opponents of the New Deal's vision. Uh, they viewed apolitical agencies as operating beyond the purview of courts as the key to administrative absolutism. To some of these opponents, there's little difference between expert agencies that FDR was setting up and the uh, fascist bureaucracies that were, develop were developing in Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy. The key to liberty for these opponents is judicial review of agency action. Agency action must be subjected to uh, independent judicial review. The APA's judicial review provision is a compromise between these com two competing visions. It doesn't do away with judicial review entirely. Uh, as some New Dealers had hoped, but it limited judicial review to arbit the arbitrary and capricious standard. So long as the agency explains its action in a reasonable way, uh, its reasons are rational, the judges can't do anything about what the agency wants to do. In other words, a judge can't make an independent assessment of social and economic needs and usurp the agency power to, uh, to figure out the right path forward. Insofar as this limit on judicial review stems from the New Dealer faith in agencies, it reflects a fairly optimistic idea that experts do in fact make their decisions impartially based on data and aren't driven by political or ideological concerns. We don't trust courts to make their own judgments um, uh, because we fear the consequences of a regime where judges can substitute their assessments for uh, in the place of this, uh, this expert and impartial opinion. Now we all know that this assumption about agency expertise is, and impartiality is often unjustified. Agency action, off, uh, action after, after all often changes with a change in a presidential administration signal, signifying the role of politics and ideology in agency decision making. But the APA at least officially continues to circumscribe judicial power to review agency action. So what courts have done in my mind is they've created various doctrines 
uh, designed to maybe smoke out agency decisions that are not necessarily driven by an impartial survey of data, enable judging, judges to call a halt to agency action agencies and tell them to start over. For example, courts give agency interpretations of the statutes that apply to those agencies considerable deference except when there's a clear reason why the interpretation is based on something other than the agency's particular aptitude. This case involves another one of these doctrines whereby a court doesn't flat out say your action is bad, but rather makes it harder for an agency to act when something other than, when perhaps something other than an impartial expert assessment of social need uh, drives agency action. The Communications Act of 1934 prohibits the broadcast of any obscene, indecent, or profane language between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. The FCC is charged when determine, to determine when language is indecent or obscene and uh, deter, has to determine when to take action against a broadcaster. Until, the two, until 2004, the FCC had a policy with so-called fleeting expletives, the sort of one-off use of an expletive. The single utterance of an expletive could be punished if the expletive were used in a literal sense. That is, if the expletive were used to depict sexual or excretory uh, functions. The non-literal use of the expletive, the use of the F word as an intensifier, for example, was not actionable unless it was used repeatedly. Um, I will abstain from an example. Uh, <laughs> even though I have one written out here and it's very funny. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll just read the facts of the case. In 2004, the FCC changed its course in response to an M NBC broadcast of the Golden Globes Awards where the singer Bono of U2 fame said in response to receiving an award, uh, he used the, the present participle of a word that begins with F, ends with K, and does, is not fire truck to describe how happy he was. Um, <laughs> The FCC rejected his previous position under which Bono's single utterance of the F word to describe something far removed from anything carnal would not have been objectionable or actionable. Instead, the FCC insisted that any use of the F word was inherently, inherently has a sexual connotation because it's one of the most vulgar and shocking words in all of the English language and because Bono used it in this gratuitous way, it's indecent and therefore actionable. If not, if that, this were not the FCC's policy, the agency concluded, then broadcasters could unleash this torrent of fleeting expletives, forcing parents to suffer the so-called first blow, their children would have to hear this fleeting expletive in one show after the next, and there's nothing the parents could do about it. The FCC couldn't take any action in response. Okay, Fox then got into hot water, and it got into hot water based on two incidents. One was during the 2002 Billboard Music Awards, where the singer Cher, upon the receipt of an award, uh, uh, told, used the F word to tell her critics what they could do with themselves. Um, <laughs> the second was during the 2003 Billboard Music Awards, where Nicole Ritchie, uh, in colloquy with Paris Hilton, uh, and reflecting on her experience living in Arkansas for the show The Simple Life, used the F word to underscore how difficult it is to get cow excrement out of a Prada purse. The FCC, using the S word to describe the cow excrement, the FCC determined that both fleeting expletives amounted to actionable indecency. The Fox and other broadcasters challenged this agency determination, and the Second Circuit essentially agreed with the broadcasters. The Second Circuit applied one of these data designed to, I'm sorry, doctrines designed to smoke out agency action that may not be driven by an impartial consideration of, of, of social needs. The DC Circuit in 1982 case uh, insisted that when an agency changes its course, the uh, standard of review is somewhat heightened above the arbitrary and capricious threshold. The Second Circuit, while not expressly saying that the standard review is as somewhat heightened, essentially agreed with the, the second, uh, with the DC Circuit, and says that the agency has to explain why the new policy does as good, if not a better job, of implementing the statute than the old one. The FCC should have given a reasoned explanation for why the old policy no longer, no longer is sufficient to implement the Communications Act um, on indecency. This requirement has some obvious appeal in my mind. If an initial pol agency policy is satisfactory, then why change it? Uh, doesn't the, shouldn't the agency have to uh, give a good explanation for why, it's, uh, uh, for why it's changing its position? The fear is that maybe political pressure is actually driving the agency to act and not some impartial or apolitical assessment of social need. The Second Circuit uh, then reviewed the agency's uh, explanations for why it changed its policy and found them, and found them uh, uh, lacking. Under the previous policy uh, of the fleeting expletive policy, broadcasters hadn't unleashed this torrent of expletives, so that seems somewhat unfounded. Under the previous policy, parents still had to suffer the first blow and have their children listen to fleeting expletives. There's nothing new here. The contention that the non-literal use of expletives is indecent under the statute because a non-literal use of an expletive inherently conjures up the idea of sex or excrement, the Second Circuit found uh, ludicrous. The Second Circuit mentioned, for example, George Bush's statement to Tony Blair that the UN had needed to get, quote, Syria to get Hezbollah to stop doing this shit, and Cheney's famous advice to Patrick Leahy that he could go fuck himself on the Senate floor, not on the Senate floor, right? he told him that on the Senate floor. Uh, 
the, the Second Circuit said, are you kidding me? These, of course, don't conjure up images of sex or excretion. One would hope not. The Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision reverses. Justice Scalia wrote for the majority, and he, sa he says it's a fairly simple uh, legal issue in his mind. There's no heightened scrutiny for heightened standard of review for when an agency changes its action. The APA as a statute doesn't provide for any different uh, threshold for uh, reviewing agency action. It's the arbitrary and capricious standard, that's it, uh, even if the agency is changing course. Uh, under the arbitrary and capricious threshold, the FCC's new policy, Justice Scalia said, is entirely rational. I'm not going to go into uh, his reasons why he found the FCC's explanations uh, reasonable. Uh, just to say that he goes to the various reasons the FCC gave for finding pleading expletives actionably indecent, and he says these are perfectly reasonable. Uh, uh, the dissenters go after Scalia on a number of grounds, and the most fun one is Justice Stevens. Uh, he takes issue with the FCC's decision to classify any expletive that has a sexual or excretory origin as indecent no matter how used. Uh, the FCC had previously stated agency policy that the deliberate and repetitive use of expletives in a patently offensive manner is a prerequisite to finding of indecency. By patently offensive, the FCC meant expletives that are used literally to describe sex or excrement. But now the FCC brings fleeting non-literal expletives within the definition of indecency because the FCC insists that any use of the expletive, literal or non-literal, will conjure up this idea of uh, image of sex or excrement. And Justice Stevens says, this isn't, this isn't right. I go golfing all the time. My partner shanks his putts all the time. And then he uses the F word. And I'm not sitting there thinking, thinking about sex when he does so. I'm thinking about a bad putt. And then Justice Stevens also points out that it's, that it's during the commercials that we have these commercials for Viagra and uh, Cialis. And aren't those more likely to conjure up the image of sex than the, word, uh, than the F word used as an intensifier? I'll let General Garr and Justice Bales discuss other fine points of the opinion. But just to ruminate on the theme of the day for the moment, or the theme as I defined it. The Second Circuit's doctrine with respect to change agency policy, in my mind, is a device to tease out situations when the agency is not necessarily acting as an impartial expert as considering the data and deciding accordingly. The premise behind the distrust of justices in the APA uh, and, and manifested in a limited judicial review provision is this is how agencies act, and we should respect them for it. If agencies don't act this way, and I don't know if the FCC was in fact acting, this, uh, was, was in fact acting uh, pursuant to political pressure, although there is some reason to think that it was, if agencies don't act this way, should we continue to dis distrust judges? If agencies don't live up to their end of the bargain, why not place some faith in judges? Give them a little bit more power to halt agency action. Give them ju judges a little more power to say, go back and do it uh, over again. I'll stop there. Mr. Barr? Sure. Um, well, I'd, I'd take a step backwards and just say that the most pressing question going into the argument in this case is whether the F word would actually be uttered in the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, and this was certainly of great interest to me, given that I was going to be one of the people arguing the case. And, and you know, it, it reminded me of a story that I've heard about the famous Cohen versus California case. And that case, of course, involved someone who's arrested for wearing um, a jacket that said F, spelled out the draft. And the, the argument in that case began with Chief Justice Berger leaning over and saying, counsel, Chief Justice Berger was a very prim and proper person. I said, counsel, we're all very well aware of the facts in this case. I think you can just <laughs> begin with the legal issues you'd like to address. <laughs> counsel stood up and said, my client was arrested for wearing a jacket that said F the draft. And that was, uh, you know, argument went on for there. Um, well, in this case, and I'm not making news here, the, the, the clerk's office actually called, called the advocates the weekend before the argument and said, um, you know, you can say what you want, um, but... Uh, I want to let you know that you know some justices aren't particularly fond of the use of that kind of language in the courtroom. So that's it. Um, you, you decide what you want to do. Um, and, and you know, I, since I was arguing that it was okay for the FCC to regulate this stuff, I thought that was a pretty good sign of the way things were going to go. Um, but it, still, nevertheless, it was it was interesting because the argument, uh, the, the advocate for the the networks um, had used the language in the Second Circuit, and even the judges used it in the Second Circuit. Uh, and I have to say, um, there are a lot of things that you worry about when you argue before the Supreme Court. But in this case, I was particularly worried that I was going to be the one that said the word because I can tell you without saying exactly what happens, there's a lot of things that go through your mind during a Supreme Court argument. And, you know, <laughs> sometimes it's that. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but uh, no one said the word. Um, the F word, in quotations, was uttered 16 times during the argument, but the actual word itself was not said during the argument. Um, this case uh, ultimately is a significant administrative law decision, as Professor Marcus 
um, mentioned. I mean, the, the, the holding of the case, um, it, it resolves an important and recurring question. Um, what is the standard of review? Um, what kind of explanation does an agency have to provide when it changes its policies? And there were two different, uh, pretty different views among the justices, and they split 5-4 in this case. Um, one was the, the majority position, which the, the agency basically has to acknowledge it's changing its position and provide some reason for the, the change. And the dissent's view was that, no, it's not enough just to do that, which is not much at all. You really have to get into the nitty-gritty and explain what changed. Why is your position different? And the FCC's rationale in this case, which on its face, I have to say, is, is quite plausible for a reason to, exchange, to change its position was not sufficient. And just to review the reason, um, the, the FCC's explanation was, well, look, we've been regulating the repeated use of expletives on TV for some time. And, and the Supreme Court's decision in a case called Pacifica, which was dealt with the, the famous George Carlin seven dirty words monologue, um, in that case, the court went out of its way to emphasize that context was key. So we're going to have a policy that at least recognizes that the single utterance of an expletive in the right context can be indecent and therefore barred by um, federal law. And then the other two explanations were that the court also recognized this first blow theory. The minute that a child in particular hears the word, um, the child is harmed. So that can happen if he hears it once. Um, and then also under the, the regime that, that purely exempts of a single utterance, it's conceivable that people could be exposed to that kind of language all day long because, you know, every broadcaster and every show would get one free pass. Of course, that hasn't happened. But nevertheless, it seems to me that's a plausible um, basis for an explanation. But who cares about the, first, the administrative law aspect of the decision? The interesting thing about this case is the First Amendment part of the decision. And the first aspect of that is the one that Professor Marcus um, mentioned, which is that you actually have the Supreme Court of the United States in a contentious 5-4 uh, decision splitting on the meaning of the F word. Um, not many people would have predicted that it would have come to that, but it did come to that. Um, and, and, and you now know that a majority of the Supreme Court thinks that the F word is indecent um, um, even when it's not used in the literal sense, notwithstanding Justice Stevens's colorful dissent. Um, the second aspect of the decision, the First Amendment decision, which is significant, is what's going to happen to Pacifica? Uh, the, the broadcasters in this case uh, and an army of amici made a really bold attempt to urge the court uh, to overrule the Pacifica decision, really to dismantle its First Amendment case law in this area altogether. And Pacifica rests, um, it, it holds that the broadcast TV is subject to a lower um, standard of scrutiny for regulation. And it bases it on this rationale that um, uh, broadcasters, uh, broadcast is more scarce and that uh, broadcast is, is particularly um, vulnerable to children, uh, the exposure to children, and the broadcast goes directly into the home. Well, as the, as the broadcasters pointed out in this case, a lot has changed uh, since 1970s. Um, when it comes to how we get our entertainment through TV in our homes. There's cable television, there's satellite television. The, the, you know, the notion that we have to carve out broadcast television has changed a lot. And so the broadcasters really made this frontal assault in the First Amendment doctrine in this case. Uh, Justice Thomas, in a separate concurring decision, said that he was perfectly willing to reconsider Pacifica and, um, and in, in another case called Red Line. Um, other justices, a number of other justices, in indicated their discomfort with the application of the First Amendment in this area. Uh, the case is going back on remand to the Second Circuit, um, and, and it is now, they're now going to tee up the constitutional issues. It'll be interesting to see um, what the Second Circuit does. If the Second Circuit does hold that the policy as applied in this case is unconstitutional, then, then I think it's quite likely that the case will get back to the, up to the Supreme Court, and the court will have to um, resolve these issues. I think many people felt that this was going to be the time that the Supreme Court was going to scale back and re revamp its case law in this area. The court didn't, and I think one of the reasons, and the last thing I would say about this, is that I think that the Supreme Court is a particularly difficult audience to convince that there ought to be more indecent language on TV. I mean, the justices are people too, but they tend to be older. They may not travel in the same circles, and so it's funny getting ready for the argument in this case during moot courts, 
you know, I got a lot, a lot of hostility from people who said, you know, what's wrong with using this language? People use it all the time. But I think the justices, you know, tend to be of a generation or of a mindset that it's, you know, perhaps less appropriate than other people think. So whatever else is going on in this area, I think, um, and the composition of the court will change and has changed. But I think it's a, it's a particularly difficult audience to argue that there should be no First Amendment standards governing the use of this kind of language on broadcast TV, at least. I, th I thought there were three interesting things about this case. Um, one was the, the avoidance of the First Amendment issue. It was, I think, at oral argument, I think Justice Ginsburg said something like, you know, we, we keep refusing to talk about the elephant in the room. And uh, it, it was interesting how the, the court was quite careful to avoid, in, in its opinion, uh, I think really intimating much on that question. The, there is a, a bit of a tension between the old Pacifica doctrine that allows the regulation of non-obscene content on broadcast media and how the court has approached the regulation of non-obscene content on the internet. Uh, you may know there's been a series of cases where the court has rejected attempts by Congress to regulate internet content with the goal of protecting children and, and has really resisted efforts to expand the uh, sort of Pacifica red lion rationale into the internet context. But of course, technically, uh, all the media are kind of merging. I mean, people, I understand you can watch TV on the internet, but um, I don't know how that works. Um, <laughs> Second, um, the second thing I thought was interesting, and this goes to some of what Professor Marcus was talking about in terms of the, the New Deal image of sort of neutral regulatory agencies that would uh, be staffed with experts and would make apolitical decisions for what in some sense would be the common good. Um, I, I guess one way to look at this case is a reflection of legal realism coming to a majority of the justices as it concerns administrative law because you, you could, you know, you, the issue at, in one sense is should it be more difficult for an agency to change an existing rule than it is for them to adopt a rule in the first place? That is, if you're looking at the rule in terms of whether it's arbitrary and capricious, should the scrutiny that a court applies be greater when the agency changes what it's doing as opposed to just adopting a new rule? Um, I think you could say one thing the, the holding does is it in some ways does make agencies more um, responsive to changes in the political climate, particularly changes in administration. Because what happens, you know, even the so-called independent agencies, with changes in administrations, they take different tacks. Different things get priority. People you know, they change their views on controversial issues that don't have easy answers. Um, the opinion in some ways reduces administrative inertia in response to changes in political administrations. It makes it easier for a new administration to go in and say, yeah, we're going to change the um, EPA's approach to regulating in this particular area, whether it would be more or less. Um, and I, I'm not sure if that reflects a a distrust for courts so much as it reflects a, a clear-eyed view that much of what administrative agencies do isn't just neutral, apolitical expert work. It's stuff that perhaps in the eyes of the court should be responsive to the consequences of elections. Um, the last point I'd, I'd make is, you know, the court also is faced with the question of if you're looking at a changed regulation, should the scrutiny be greater because the new regulation might raise constitutional concerns that weren't present with the prior regulation. And, and the court rejected a suggestion that this is somehow analogous to when courts are interpreting statutes and they're trying to avoid constitutional questions. And you've heard of the doctrine of constitutional avoidance. You construe statutes, if possible, to avoid presenting constitutional questions. The majority opinion says that's not, that's not at all implicated when you're talking about court review of administrative action. If an administrative agency has done something that's truly contrary to the Constitution, there's another part of the Administrative Act, Administrative Procedure Act that addresses that. There's a 
provision that says you set aside agency action if it's contrary to law. So what, what the majority opinion does is it sets up a very sort of uh, discrete type of analysis. You look at the new rule to determine if it's arbitrary and capricious based on things like whether the agency has considered new information, whether it's recognized it is changing course. But the fact that the new rule might raise constitutional current concerns, the majority indicates, isn't part of the arbitrary and capricious inquiry. Instead, it's only relevant if, in fact, you determine there's a constitutional violation and, and that comes in under the contrary to law prong of, of the APA. Um, yeah, and I guess one thing I would add on that um, is that this case is sort of a good example of something that Chief Justice Roberts has tried to do since he's come onto the court, which is decide cases on the narrowest grounds. Um, there were sort of two different parts of the analysis. The first was whether the agency's uh, reasoning was adequate, its explanation for the change was adequate for purposes of the APA. That was the decision that the Second Circuit had decided below. It held that no, the agency's decision was not inadequate. And then the Second Circuit went on to say, nevertheless, you know, we also think that this policy is, is pretty much blatantly constitutional, but we don't have to actually say that because we're just holding that its, its explanation was inadequate. And so the case gets up to the Supreme Court. Um, the government petitions for cert and says the Second Circuit got wrong in saying that the FCC's explanation was inadequate. It is that. It's, it was perfectly fine. You don't need to reach the constitutional question. You should just decide that issue and send it back to the Second Circuit and let it consider the constitutional question in the first instance. The broadcast, then you had the broadcasters saying, well, you know, whatever you do in the, the administrative law question, you know, we think the Second Circuit got it right, but the two questions kind of blend together, and you really ought to take on this big uh, First Amendment issue, what Justice Ginsburg called the elephant in the room. And uh, the, the court declined to do that. I mean, the court said, is, look, we're going to take this one step at a time. We think the explanation was adequate. Um, the, the lower court did not yet decide the constitutional question. It's an important constitutional question. We want to get the benefits of its views first. So we're going to send the case back to the Second Circuit, allow it to make a decision on the constitutional issue. And then if we need to address that, we can do that again. And that's sort of a, a, a victory for what the Chief Justice has tried to accomplish there. And then the last, the, the other point I wanted to make is um, the administrations have, of course, changed again. So one way in which this case might not get back up to the Supreme Court is the current administration might choose to change um, the policy of the FCC uh, that was at issue in this case. So just the other day, um, the, the administration announced it, that it was rethinking the Janet Jackson episode, which is something that was um, actually tied to this case. Um, the Supreme Court sent that case back down to the Third Circuit for reconsideration in light of its decision in the, the Fox case here. Um, so it's conceivable that um, the, the administration's position will change. Um, I, I will say, though, that in speaking with people who have a better sense of what things are going on at the FCC, the FCC um, is set up as an independent agency, um, which is different than, than other executive agencies. Um, and one of the reasons why um, it enacted the policy at issue in the Fox case to begin with, extending its ban on indecent cover, indecent, uh, the ban, uh, prohibition on indecent language on broadcast TV, was that Congress had pushed it to that place. So it's not clear that the FCC is going to change its position, um, but it certainly has uh, the authority to do so. I have a, a question for my co-panelists, but just first, I, if I were advising the president right at the moment, I would advise him not to reconsider the policy here, because the last thing he needs uh, in trying to push through his health care plan is to have his opponents saying that he wants children to learn the F word um, <laughs> on television. My question is, is this. Uh, it seems to me that, that fairly seismic shifts in administrative law oftentimes happen at the end of a particular regulatory regime or the perceived end of a regulatory regime. So in the, especially in the D.C. Circuit in the early 1980s, there seemed to be a lot of action in administrative law um, as the Reagan Revolution started getting up and running. Um, the, 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 the deregulatory emphasis of the Reagan, Reagan administration teed up a lot of questions. And, and because maybe the D.C. Circuit was staffed with a lot of uh, Jimmy Carter picks or, 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 or uh, uh, judges left over from more uh, regu regulation-friendly Republican administrations, uh, the, the, there were a lot of very important administrative law decisions coming out of that time. And I wonder if that, first of all, if that perception is, tr is, is right. And secondly, if that is the case, will we see a similar 
I guess it depends on what the Obama administration does, but with the perceived end of the age of Reagan, will we see a similar uh, emphasis on rethinking administrative law in the next decade? <laughs> Another benefit of living in Arizona as compared to Washington, D.C. is I had to do very little administrative law, so I don't, I don't really feel qualified to comment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think oftentimes you see the administrative law docket sort of driven by change of administrations because that's a lot of times when agencies are rethinking things or, or, thinking, or, or just enacting new policies. And, and those policies are challenged. They get into the courts, and that's how the administrative law is made, at least the, the sort of procedural administrative decisions, like the decision in this case about what the standard re of review is um, for reviewing an agency's change in decision. But in terms of the, the broader historical question, I, I just don't know the answer. Any questions from the audience? Professor Ayer? It's not really a question, but uh, one of the reasons I have always admired uh, John Harlow, Justice John Harlow, he wrote the opinion in Cohen versus California. And here was this great uh, patrician uh, sitting on the court, and he spelled it out. Maybe I can generate a question out of that, and that is um, to Mr. Garr, who's, who served in the Solicitor General's office for so long, and Justice Bales, who was there for a year. Is it uncommon for the clerk's office of any court in which you're going to participate in an argument to call and suggest that you might not want to use certain words? Well, it's never happened in my experience before. I mean, it is a really interesting point. I mean, you can leave it to you to decide whether we're moving backwards or forwards. But, I mean, for example, the decision in this case actually, you know, blocks out the language. It doesn't repeat the language that was used, even, even in describing the facts of the case. Um, and, and I think you're quite right. If you go back and read Cohen, uh, the, leader isn't, the reader isn't left to his imagination as to what was on the jacket. Other questions? Well, I want to thank you all for coming today. I thought this was really fantastic. My mind did not wander at all during your discussion. And I want to thank you, and please help me thank our panelists. <laughs>